Oh, the weather outside is frightful. But inside is so delightful. It's Christmas in July. Let's review. Let's review. Let's review. Want more? Look for season four. four. Bomb. Bomb. Yes, greetings, armchair imagineers. Welcome to the penultimate installment of Christmas in July 2017. Dragon, how is your holiday in the summertime going? Eh, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Dragon, you know what I'm realizing right off the bat that I don't want to deal with the whole podcast is that my uh, my video is severely lagging. I don't know why. I tried restarting my computer right before we went on. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a screen cap to use, Dragon, because, you know, we, we see all the Christmas stuff. It's there. There's a set. Hi, Grinch. Let's see. We got, we got Olaf here. We got Olaf. You know, he's kind of our summer mascot for Christmas in July. All right. You guys good? Okay, so folks, what we are here to do tonight is we are here to come up with Christmas special pitches for essentially Dragon. I was kind of doing mine on Netflix. That was my that was my idea is to kind of do like a one hour Netflix special. I don't know where you kind of fell in. Uh well, my essentially mine. I'd love mine to be on Netflix, but I think there's a chance it could be on TV. But whatever it is, is like the Marvel money behind it. So either or. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's just dive right into it then, folks. Of course, the only criteria for this is that it has to have, uh, basically, we're doing pitches for the Spider-Man Homecoming version of the Spider-Verse. Now, Dragon, uh, I, I don't know about you. I, I, I haven't really incorporated any of the in MCU, like, other characters. Like, I, to me, I mostly just stuck to the Spider-Man mythos. Uh but, you know, other other things included in, in the MCU are fine as well. But, you know, of course, it's just kind of taking the characters that we knew to grow in love and homecoming and hopefully give them a little bit more pathos. Uh, that's what we're here to do tonight and give the Incredible Hulk a great big holiday gift. Oh, yes. Right. All right. And uh, also, uh, just, uh, of course, the way we go about these pitches, folks, is earlier we did the 13 reasons uh, you know, before we've done the 13 reasons why. Uh, Christmas pitch. You know, we're going to go Act One. Act basically go back and forth. Act mm -hmm. One, Two, Three, and because it's Marvel property, uh, mid credit then post credits. Back again, back oh, yeah. and forth. So that's how we're going to fire off. Deke, you you start us off. Okay, uh, I do not have a title for my for my special one. How funny! I actually have a title really? for mine. <laughs> It's I very a, simple, but it's... it's I'll, I'll admit my 13 Reasons Why special was garbage, but I thought I had a good title for it, 13 Days of Christmas. But um, anyways. Okay, okay. yeah. Uh, I don't have a title, but I will say that my main focus is going to be on the lizard. And Dragon, I, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but I'm kind of cross-pollinating with the Raimi-verse in sort of a fun way throughout this special. Uh, I'm not bringing back everyone in, to reprise their roles and everything like that. I'm bringing back two people in particular to reprise their roles. Uh, one of them being Kurt Connors. The other one should be obvious if you've been paying attention to what we want. Um, <laughs> okay, so Dylan Baker returns as Dr. Kurt Connors, Dragon. He is... Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say he's exactly the same guy that we saw in the Sam Raimi movie, but... Of course, he is playing the same character. Well, he'd have to be a high school teacher instead of a college. That's the thing. That's the thing. He would be a high school teacher in this one. So that would probably be the big difference. Uh, of course, in this one, Dragon, I don't remember. In the original Raimi-verse, did he have his arm missing? Yes, he did. Okay, yeah. okay. Just just checking. Just checking. It's, not half the character. it's literally half the character. He's well, missing. no, I, I just I wasn't sure if they were like if they were that far along in the mythology yet or not with him. I, I wasn't sure if that was like a... Thing they were building up towards anyway so yeah okay so he's got his so he's got his arm missing of course uh and dragon i i don't know i think you're gonna like the uh the christmas assignment that dr connors came up with okay because you know what the first image of the special is what uh putting the mistletoe underneath the microscope nice nice <laughs> All right. yeah so, so basically is a fun holiday assignment kurt connors is like you know it's kind of a nice like Fun, easy A, you know what I mean? Like, Kurt Connors is like, all right, class, here's what we're going to do. You guys are going to get any Christmas-related thing that you can think of. 
and uh, put it under a microscope and, you know, like using the scientific terms that we've come up with in the class, you know, like write down what you see. So basically like groups of people, like we have like eggnog under the microscope, you know, and like, and like stuffing from Santa hats and yeah, candy canes, wrapping paper, and of course, mistletoe underneath the microscope. So yeah, so that's a, that's kind of a fun, uh, you know, a fun way to start out, fun way to start out. So, Dragon, we kind of established what's been going on with uh, Ned and Peter and Michelle. Essentially, those three are kind of like, you know, they're like a trio. They're like the three amigos at this point. They're, uh, you know, they're kind of this big nerd clique. Uh, right. And let's see, uh, Ned and Peter are basically competing to get Michelle the ultimate nerd Christmas present. I see. Peter hasn't decided what present he wants to get her. He wants to make hers a little more personal. Ned, however, is dead set on what he wants to get her. Now, Dragon, I want you to take a guess at it. I'll give you a hint. Uh, it's another Lego Star Wars set. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> could it be Hoth? No, I'll give you one more hint. It's, it is based around the Empire. Okay, so it's the Empire specifically. Yeah, it's specifically an, an Empire set, yes. And you're, when I say Hoth, I also mean like the, the Imperial Walker, so it's no Imperial Walker? It's not an ATST, ATST. Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, uh, oh, good. Uh, is, is it along the, same, along the same lines of the Death Star. It's, it's not the second Death Star, is it? No. Jeez, uh, a Star Destroyer? Yeah, a Star Destroyer, you got it. There you we go, okay, there <laughs> we go, Star Destroyer, okay. All right, so yes, Ned is like, I I'm telling you, Peter, She it, Lego Star Destroyer, it's Lego, and it's Star Wars. <laughs> all right, uh, you know, and of course, Michelle is just being like all nonchalant about it, like, you guys are really fighting over a girl in front of her? You guys are losers, <laughs> you know. But she's doing it in like a playful way, you know. She's she's cracking a smile when she calls. Well, are they losers. actually trying to win over affection, or just like a friend thing? Uh, it's kind of a little bit of both. Like it is a friend thing, but I think Peter and Ned are both secretly kind of crushing on her. Okay. So that it, trust me, it'll come like it'll come to to a head throughout the special. That's kind of like a big part of it, anyways. Okay, so. Uh, so let's see. While at the mall, uh, Peter sees a jacket that is like kind of like a, a classic, like frumpy Michelle jacket. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like it would it would fit with her wardrobe, but it's a little bit outside his price range. It's a little bit outside his price range. Um, in the same mall, he spots a woman who's uh, he her car broke down, her truck broke down actually of Secret Santa presents for needy children, and Peter sees the opportunity. He's like. Hey, ma'am, I'll deliver the presents. Oh, thank you, kind sir. And we, and I know, Dragon, I know it's kind of like a cheap comic book setup, but go with it, all right? Because it, it leads to a fantastic montage of uh, Spider-Man swinging around with a, with a sack of presents set to Jingle Bell Rock. You and I are going to have some similarities. <laughs> we probably side. will. We probably will. Mine goes in a really different direction, but I think we're starting to <laughs> Let's keep going, keep going. So just imagine, like, Spider-Man, like, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell, Rock. He, like, or Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell, Flip. And, of, co of, co of course, the big thing is, uh, you know, they have to time, like, when they sing Jingle Bell Swing, you have to get a good web swing. Jingle Bell Swing. <laughs> and, like, you know, Spider-Man, like, he's, like, throwing presents and then shooting webs on them to stick them to doors, you know, and he's going and yeah. greeting the kids and like, hey, kids, you know, like, yay, it's Spidey Santa. You know, it's adorable. Spider Claws. Adorable. Yeah, Spider Claws. That's much better than, better than Spidey Santa. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And of course, Dragon, more importantly, the whole time, uh, we're getting great publicity photos for Spider-Man. Yeah. Because Peter Parker has taken a job at the daily bugle of course <laughs> and here we have it dragon the man the myth the legend himself as peter walks by betty brandt who's taken up an internship at the daily at the daily All right. bugle. Oh, by the way tiki i meant to mention this on homecoming did you know the girl who plays uh, betty brandt in the homecoming uh, in the mcu 
Uh, that's yeah. the girl from Nice Guys. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's, that's really she, good casting. Yeah, I remember she was cast in the movie. Yeah, okay. Nice, that's really nice. good casting. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing more of Betty Brant going forward. I love that character, and that's a good actress. I her. would honestly love to see like Betty Brant as a main interest for for t Peter Parker in a Spider-Man well, movie. Well, we know Peter does have a thing for uh, for Betty Brant. I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll mm -hmm. see. Maybe she has a crush on him instead. He's going to switch it up. Well, anyway, great. keep, keep, keep going. Okay, so walking by Bre uh, Betty Brant is in it. Yeah, it's just a quick little cameo, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean? sure. Like, hey, there's Betty Brandt. Yeah. <laughs> and then, okay, Dragon, you're ready for the line. You're ready for the line. Yeah. So Jay Jonah Jameson turns around. Of course, it's J.K. Simmons, yep. and he yells, "Parker, you look a lot longer than a, a lot. You look a lot younger than the last time I saw you. What are you doing, drinking from the fountain of youth? Whatever this kid's having for breakfast, I want some." Now, Dragon, I just want to point out, I like that line specifically because of how specific he gets, like, whatever this kid's having for breakfast, specifically. I don't know. I just feel like that's a classic JJ-ism. No, that's, that's a fun little fourth <laughs> way of, of, of addressing the whole difference in Spider-Man. Well, exactly. I mean, that's what I've been pitching the whole time. I mean, if you go back through the podcast, I've probably given, like, a variant on that line, like about five or six times in different pitches and speculations that we've done for Spider-Man over the years. Hey, let's let's face it, folks. If we can have just one character, if we can have like one actor from most of the eight, eight different franchises, Spider-Man films going to come in for uh, come for the MCU. If we can only have one, obviously we go to J.K. Simmons as J.J. James. Oh, yeah. If we could have one. Oh, yeah. And of course, with this, I'm giving, I'm doing two just because, let's face it, poor Dylan Baker, man, that guy got screwed. He did. He was in the whole trilogy. They were building him up, and he was and good. He was, he was it was good. Yeah, yeah. Role. You know, he's helping Spider-Man on the uh -huh. side. Very uh -huh. much kind of a Lucius Fox of Spider-Man, <laughs> right? Oh man. Okay, so basically, Dragon. The problem with the pictures that Peter gave him is that these are pictures of Spider-Man helping orphans. Parker, that doesn't help my cause at all. Don't you know what this paper is all about? It's all about exposing Spider-Man for the menace that he is. God. I'll give you half cut. <laughs> he hit Ant Man. Everyone loves Ant Man. Oh, God. <laughs> and then we mention uh, we basically have a direct callback to Spider Man Two, where he mentions my son, the astronaut, <laughs> <laughs> who's uh, you know he's a little forlorn. You know he's a little bit like my son, the astronaut, is up in space, and it's my first Christmas without him, Parker. Oh. So in a way, in a way. JJ is kind of our Scrooge, Dragon. All right. He's kind right. of our Scrooge. That's cool. I mean, he doesn't have a lot to do, but in terms of, like, you know, the arcs, I would say that he's got the Scrooge arc. Okay. Okay. And, of course, Dragon, just the whole, like, my the astronaut being up in space thing, like, we don't directly, you know, we, we don't directly say it, but if you're smart, you're going to put the pieces together and be like, ah, symbiote, and they're doing it the right way. The astronauts are actually going coming back with the symbiote. Yep. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me see. I, I, I'm speeding through Act 1, Dragon, so I'm going to be done quickly here. Okay, so we see Kurt Connors in his lab with the lights off, and he's watching a slideshow of pictures of his son growing up, uh, and this is over multiple Christmases. So it's, you know, it's like Billy's first Christmas, Billy's fifth Christmas, you know, just uh, kind of seeing his son grow up, and honestly, throughout the special, we don't really know why Connors is isolated from Billy and his family, but we just kind of get the sense, like, we get just enough information to piece together that he's kind of putting himself, he's kind of exiling himself from the family because he's just afraid of what he might become. And he's just kind of, like, humiliated. And, and you know, he's just kind of, like, driven into his own work, too. So, you know, he's kind of like an exile right now about it. But we well, don't... Is, it, is he an exile because, like, he's, he's beginning treatments for lizard stuff or what? Yes. I mean, he will be beginning treatments for the lizard stuff. Uh, but he's more in exile because he's been just trying, like, trying to find a cure for the missing arm and everything. And it's just been, like, consuming right, him. Right, right. Okay, so the, the pursuit of the treatment. Okay. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, basically, like... We don't know how far estranged from his family he is. We just kind of get these hints. I kind of left it a little bit up in the air. At least we're addressing the kid this time. At least oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're definitely addressing the kid. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Um, 
uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. We just get a quick, uh, quick gl- glimpse of Carner, you know, like being remorseful, looking at the kid and everything, looking at the pictures. Okay, so next, uh, so Peter, Ned, and Michelle, they've decided that they will be dissecting Ned's Lego Death Star for the microscope experiment uh. as their, uh, it cuts to the lunch table the next day. Uh, you know, so. And also, uh, also Ned's kind of like, Michelle, get, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Ned's like, the Lego Death Star, a.k.a. the world's most epic Christmas present. And, you know, you can just tell, like, Ned is just so proud of his Lego Star stuff. Destroyer. No, 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 they're deconstructing the Death Star. Oh, okay, Ned, I'm sorry. I Ned hasn't that. bought, the, Ned's going right. to buy the Star Destroyer for Michelle. Okay, I got you now. Yeah, but uh, Ned already has the Lego Death Star, and he's basically being a salesman right now dragon like the lego death star it's got three thousand pieces it's a you know it's a scale replica of the real thing in lego form <laughs> all right uh they're you know they're just doing their presentation in class okay so dragon i'm gonna need your help on the logistics here all right because I want a I want an Adrian Toomes cameo, but I'm not sure where Adrian Toomes is currently located. Well, we know where he's located. Tell me. I I, I just don't remember. Well, he's in prison, TV. No, I know, but like where which prison? Like oh, right. where? Is he out of state or what? Well, I know he's uh he's in New York. I'm I'm pretty sure he's, he's in, in New, New York, York. Which I, I don't think he's in Rikers. I think he's only one of the fictional uh Okay, you know what? As as long as he's in New York, that's all I need to know. There is a chance he could be at the raft, which could be like right it's it's yeah, you know, wherever we saw in Civil War, that he could be there, but it's it's unclear. They didn't really specify where he was, but he is a super criminal, which is where they put the guys from the raft, so it's it's the point is he's in a prison. Let's just say it's in New York. It's a prison. Okay. Well, just for the sake of sentimentality and because we love Michael Keaton Dragon, let's just suspend the rules of disbelief and have Peter swing by the prison, literally, and visit Adrian Toomes in prison. You know, during the typical like visit, you know, you like behind the glass and everything, much like Flash and Flash's dad. You know what I mean? Like that kind of setup. Right. Uh, and Dragon, I think you're going to like this. First of all, Toombs warns Peter about the Scorpion. He's like, there's a man, Peter. There's a man here that just got released, and he's he's looking for you. Like, I, I tell you, son, like, I I didn't go after him. Like, you have, I'm indebted to you for saving my life, so I'm not going to give you up. But this man's looking. And so, you know, we, we get some setup for the Scorpion. And then, uh, and then also, I think you're going to really like this, Dragon, uh, Peter gives him a present, which is basically a collection of yearbook photos taken with Liz in it. Basically kind of showing off, like, you know, like how multi-talented Liz was, you know, because she's on, like, the cheerleading squad and the, you know, and the uh, whatever the 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 trivia thing that the, the decathlon, yeah. the ac- academic decathlon and... You know, and like all, all kinds of different stuff, you know, like community service and, you know, like basically the whole idea is like, look how amazing your daughter is. and You've got a great family. And, you know, so basically we're establishing that Peter and Toons are like good with each other. You know what I mean? Uh, that's cool. But I want to uh, specify. So you're saying like, uh, like Liz sent these to Peter and then he like. He no, no, no. Him. I'm saying that Peter got this on his own accord. Well, yeah, I remember she's she, she's not at the school anymore. No, I know that. And that's why he. uh because basically Liz was a senior in homecoming. Yeah. And so Peter like basically went through the four years that she was in high school through the okay. yearbooks, like okay. archived yearbooks. And okay. like and like clip pictures out of that, with the school's that, permission, of course. What's nice is that that's uh you know, it's it's Peter kinda of using his photo prowl. Uh, yeah, exactly. Sense. Exactly. That's what I had in mind. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's just like it's a good cameo for Michael Keaton. I'd really like to see the vulture and Peter Parker and kind of an alliance going forward, and I think this is some good setup for that. All right, so let's see. Uh, so then we get to Peter arriving back home in Queens, and we have the first big action set piece, which is him fighting Michael Mandau as the Scorpion, who's prowling the neighborhood. Prowling the neighborhood, so he got out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he got out. Well, yeah, I told you, Toomes warned Peter that he got out. Okay. And uh, so basically, Dragon, the gist of this fight is that he's fighting Scorpion. And at this point, he's not going to have the Scorpion tail or anything yet. At this point, it's just going to be uh, uh, just I'm sorry. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Whatever the name of the 
guy is. Matt Gargan. Yeah, Matt Gargan. Yeah, at this point, it's just going to be Matt Gargan. You know, it's just going to be Michael Mandau. Like, we're going to save some of the, uh, you know, like, basically the Scorpions dropping by to be like, hey, remember this guy at the end of Homecoming? You know, like, Essentially, he's a small-time cartel guy right now. That's where he is right now. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, he's kind of, and so basically the gist of this fight is that uh, he's broken into the house and Aunt May is out. Aunt May is at the airport picking up a relative who we will soon meet. So he figured it out. He figured out that Peter's Spider-Man. Yes, yes. And uh, so basically the gist of this fight is that Peter knows that Aunt May is going to be like if like if Aunt May knew about uh knew that there was a criminal who stalked Peter directly to the house, you know, like that that would just be it. Like she would just boil over, you know, because of course we get that cliffhanger at the end of Homecoming. We have to address in this that she knows that Peter is Spider Man. Yes, and so which, made this of, hard, which made this hard to write, by the way. Wade, <laughs> made, they all know that Peter Spider Man. That's cool. It's just like in for like not doing like a, basically a sequel. You doing kind of like the, the fill in the blanks type stuff. That's that's oh, so difficult. Right, but basically the idea is that this fight, like Peter's trying to take it as far away from Queens as possible. So yep. he's like essentially like swinging Mandau up, and he doesn't want Mandau anywhere near Queens. Right, like he doesn't want to see. Like basically, his plan is to just stick him to the side of a building on a web or something like, like on that, the, like in the Bronx or something. Like, right, so, right, yeah, right. Like the next adjoining city would be like the Bronx. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly, because the whole idea he is he doesn't want to see Aunt May driving by and you know seeing some guy like webbed up. You know what I mean? Because right. Aunt May will connect the dots very quickly on that. <laughs> okay, so uh, of course we you know so that's basically what happens. You know the guy gets stuck up on the Bronx on a building, and uh, Peter makes an anonymous phone call reporting him, and uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then we get a family. Oh god, I'm really not sure how you're gonna feel about this. All right, are you ready? Yes. So the woman that May was picking up at the airport was May's mother. Would you like to guess who plays May's mother? Let me guess. Rosemary Harris. Yep, Rosemary Harris. Da 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 da. -da. <laughs> now look, like I don't, this is one this is one of those casting calls even I wasn't really all that comfortable with because I, I mean I wish I had more for the character to do but essentially here I am going for like a like a like a rolodex of actors and things like hey let's go let's go we're, 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 oh oh and I've got a Franco cameo don't you worry I've got a Frankie well, Franco, Franco cameo Franco like it Simmons is necessary and everything else is like come on now we're just forcing everything in there <laughs> it's it sounds I would like say so I would be pushing it if I went into like def if I went into to like Defoe. That's what I'm but, saying. Uh, Come on, Defoe. That, that's a hair too far. Oh, but you might not like my Uncle Ben then. All right, let's just keep we'll going. See. We'll see. I'm very curious how I you're going to feel about I am, my. I'm proud of my casting. It's a good casting. You know I'm what? I'm I'm proud of my casting on Uncle Ben as well. Yeah, I think I got I got some good Uncle Bens. So anyway, keep going. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so yeah. Look, the whole point of Rosemary Harris showing up is May's mother is basically like. A, if we wanted to in continuity, it'd be kind of like, well, the May that we met in, you know, in the Raimi trilogy was like Peter Parker's great aunt uh, in the alternate universe where Peter Parker is like Tobey Maguire, <laughs> right? But, um, you know, just it, it kind of helps kind of alleviate the age gap with May a little bit, I think. And, uh, you know, just it'd be nice to see Rosemary Harris again. And also, more specifically, Dragon, I just needed May to be out of the house. And I thought it'd be fun to have, like, as we're having this action scene, having May stuck in traffic, calling Peter, like, oh, Peter, I'm sorry, we're stuck in traffic, you know, like, you can you can take something out of the fridge for dinner. And Peter's like, uh, okay, Aunt May, th that's fine. I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> so that kind of, you know, I, I don't know. I just like the whole idea of, like, stuck in tra traffic at the airport which I would say is probably a trope. All right. Let's see. So, okay, so let's see. Uh, 
May is also in kind of dismay because she can't find Ben's old Vietnam photographs. She said uh, Ben always kept, she was looking through Ben's desk and he always kept them on the second drawer of the desk and she can't find them anywhere. And uh, this presents us with a flashback dragon and here we go, here we go, down the rainy rabbit hole once again. You want to know who's playing Uncle Ben? Well, one second. You're saying Uncle Ben would, uh, he would have been like around 18 in Vietnam? Yeah, something like that. Sure. That's fine. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, who do we? Like in, in his early 20s, in his early 20s, something like that. Right. Okay, Dragon, look. I didn't just pull this guy because of the rainy thing, all right? I, I want you to know that right up top, all right? The reason I pulled this guy is because I do think this guy has a very fatherly quality to him. And he's also, he'd be kind of a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a cool variation on the standard Uncle Ben that we've seen. He'd be a little bit younger than the Uncle Bens that we've seen, but also able to really carry that fatherly wisdom. And also it'd be a cool kind of uh, tie, not just to Raimi, but also a fun nod at the comic books as well. We're getting Alfred Molina. Come on down. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Well, I really do like Alfred Molina. And I That's want to the think thing, Dragon. I, I think that Alfred Molina would make a really good Uncle Ben. Like, you don't have to have him look anything like Dr. Octopus, right? Like, that'd be the trick. Like, putting him, put him in some kind of balding wig. You know what I mean? Give him a Give him new makeup, you know? Like, like he's going to look older than he looked in 2004 in Spider-Man 2 anyways. Like, obviously, he's not playing the same character. But what I want from this guy, you know, because because Alfred Molina, he's kind of got that Eastern European charm thing going on, right? And I want that from Uncle Ben as well. I want Uncle Ben to kind of have a little bit of a, like, he's kind of like a second-generation American. You know what I mean? Like, his father hailed from... Uh, from Eastern Europe. Like that's kind of the vibe I want to get from Uncle Ben. Uh, just a little bit more of a spice on him, you know? And uh, so yeah, Fred Molina, like I said, I, and of course it's also the fun thing, Dragon. I, I couldn't resist it. Like the cherry on top with this casting for me was just the whole fun fact in the comics. Like, oh, in the comics, Aunt May has a thing for Dr. Octopus. Uh, <laughs> that explains it. I will that admit that was part of my thought process. I will admit that. And I know, I know, Melina could do it, but again, it's like that's uh, part of me feels like I believe yeah, I applaud the the cast interest at the same time. I'm like, you know, well, again, we're pulling way too much. That, that one's going to be no as well. J.J. James, like he is that he is, you know, J.K. Simmons is that role. Everyone else though, it's a little bit like, yeah, it's kind of. I don't know. The makeup you're kind of selling me. I'm a little, I'm miffy on it. Keep going. Okay, okay. Uh, so basically, we get a flashback, and basically, it's kind of the same. It's the same sort of car scene that we got with the original Raimi Spider-Man, but it's got a bit of a variation on it. Uh, essentially, Ben is asking Peter... I'm sorry, this is a flashback. Yeah, this is a flashback. We get a flashback from uh, from May mentioning the Vietnam photos. Okay, so uh, so Molina, he he takes out of his jacket pocket a an envelope that's filled with his Vietnam photos that he was... Uh, you know, that he usually had in his drawer, in his desk drawer. And, you know, keep in mind, this is the this is the event where he's dropping Peter off to go to the... He thinks Peter's going to the library. Instead, Peter's going to go to the wrestling match. And so, basically, Ben's like, hey, Peter, you know, like, while you're at the library, can you do me a favor and get on the computer and, you know, do the Photoshop thing that you kids do and touch up a few of these photos, a few of these Vietnam photos. It'd be great to see you know, to see him like touched up a little, they're a little worn for wear. And essentially dragon, we have, uh, we see through the photos kind of Ben, not only being very heroic, but also we see Ben kind of being the face of, you know, like every, basically every photo, like what I want to visualize with these photos is every photo of Ben. Uh, ben is the one who has a look of triumph on his face. He's the one who, you know, who's like, you know, who's bold and determined and who, who's really not letting adversity get to him. Like, that's really what I want to kind of power through with these photographs. Um, and of course, like I said, he, he's giving the, basically he's giving the pictures to Peter for two reasons. One, because he wants to, you know, he wants to give Peter kind of the busy work at the library, maybe not, you know, maybe kind of like get him off the streets a little bit. You know, we don't know what's going on with him at this stage. 
And two, you know, also just to appreciate the man that Ben is in the film photos you know like and especially if you're working in something like photoshop that's a really good opportunity to really get down to the nitty-gritty of the details of a photo right. so i thought that was a good kind of motivation for ben right there All right. okay so then uh we get a quick a quick cut of the cage match with bone saw oh, come on you're using bone saw again <laughs> i'm using on. bone saw but you're gonna love who i cast as him you'll find out who i cast as him in uh the second act uh, and basically, the end of the second act is the flashback ends with Peter. Uh, he's in the wrestling cage, and he realizes that the envelope filled with Uncle Ben's pictures was dropped in the wrestling ring. Oh. And that's the end of act. That's the end of act one. So essentially, Peter's going to have to go back to the place where the spy where the Spider Man mythology had its unfortunate beginnings to reclaim what is properly his. All right. Two. All right. Yeah. Act two, Dragon. Oh, or, I'm sorry, act one for you. Act yeah. one for you. <laughs> Go All on. right, uh, let me let me uh, amend something I was saying before you said dawned to me. Yeah, I, I, I kind of figured so I completely really forgot. But yes, mine is uh, is absolutely on Netflix. So I need the full hour. Mine's, mine's okay. On okay. Cool. So, um, uh, mine's on Netflix as per usual. I try to make this thing as uh, as viable as you can. Like you, this could actually happen between movies. I gotta like kind of walk line, not doing the sequel, but I do have some setup here. And I also find a way of kind of doing some familiar stuff and referencing some familiar stuff from Spider Man, but kind of doing it through the Homecoming MCU vibe of you know we're gonna we're gonna do things differently. If uh, it, it's kind of my mantra of like uh, after seeing Homecoming, after especially a few times, kind of dawned on me that the way we're doing the MCU Spider Man is. We've kind of accepted the other the other uh, franchises as a uh, as kind of like you know takes on like a Spider-Man era of stories. Uh -huh. And uh, you going forward, we're gonna like kind of see stuff we haven't seen before with Spider-Man primarily. But what I'm gonna argue in addition to that is like, uh, and I'd recommend this going forward in the, the MCU is that let's not be afraid to uh, to reintroduce familiar concepts, but we're gonna do it differently. So that, that's kind of my my thesis along okay. with kind of like okay. what the like direction it. they're going. So I might step on some familiar toes. I'm going to do something different and fun with it. So, okay. Uh, my title is, and it, believe me, it has, has good resonance, especially at the end. It all pays off in the end, folks. Merry Christmas, Spider-Man. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a heartwarming title if I've ever heard one. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you're going to love that with, with the payoff is. I know all right, you're all right. Love it. <laughs> love it. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay, act <laughs> one. Okay, we start. Memories of the Essence. Okay, uh, we start, we see flickering lights, you know, we go from like, you know, regular uh, dark to red, you know, like the red emergency light, importantly the red. Uh, we see a man wearing a green suit, a man in green is emptying ATMs with merely a touch. He is whistling jingle bells. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> and then, of course, Spider-Man, he kind of enters you know, kind of in that classic Spider-Man pose where they don't get enough, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of web, kind of webbing down kind of like in the Spider-Man kiss position, you know, you know, he's kind of like all webbed up and upside down. And he's, <laughs> he has that equipment and says, well, if it isn't the Grinch, you stole Christmas. Let's give you that that tingly feeling, and basically he tells Karen to use the taser webs. You know, basically give him that you know a taser tingly, warm tingly feeling inside. You know, make his heart go through size that day. <laughs> you know, he, he got, you know web slings a little taser. He shoots a taser web at him, no effect. The guy then turns around, he grabs it and electrifies the web, breaking the web show. The web shoes, you know, web web shoes. It, it's done. Then to reveal, of course, that's the great introduction of Electro. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. So here's my take on Electro. So, again, I wanted to leave room to grow. So There is room to grow in this, but here's where we're going to do Electro differently and make them fun. So, I'm kind of doing... A actually, I'm kind of doing what I've always wanted to do with the Scorpion, but we're doing a different take with the Scorpion. So, it's kind of, a, kind of mixing some stuff I've wanted to see in Spider-Man for a long time here. So, this Electro, he's a young hotshot. He's essentially, just to boil it down here, he's like... Uh, if Peter was irresponsible with his power, that's what we were doing with Electra. He was also a young guy, like maybe like a year or two older than Peter Parker. He's like, if he's not 17, then maybe he's 19. Uh, I'm kind of going with the classic stuff. It's, he's in the class, as close to the classic suit of Electro as you can get. I mean, he's in the green and yellow and he has a mask. It's a practical suit though. So essentially it's like a green non-conductive suit, you know, like a green like head, uh, you know, like a green suit and it has these these yellow coils on it, kind of looking like lightning bolts. They look, you know, like the yellow coils kind of filter out the electricity into like a, uh, the best way of putting it. He has like a web shooter for his whole body. And that's the way the original Electro oh, went. He, okay. he was a guy who was struck by lightning and he was a conductor of electricity. And he built like a, like a web shooter suit that shot lightning instead of webs. 
over his body. So I'm kind of doing that with it. Um, so bit, again, I'm doing the original version, but like let's say down the line, you know, it has a mishap with the suit. Then it be, then it becomes like he evolves and he becomes the you know, the the electro like we saw with Jamie Foxx. He's all electricity head to toe. Right, right, okay. And in terms of actor, I have two choices here. One I've kind of been saving for Harry Osborne, so I'm saying he's a maybe. Like Dylan Minetti, honestly, I'd I like to see his Harry Osborne. <laughs> I can see that. That that'd be great. So I'm Dylan saying, Minetti like, just Dylan Minetti should like have a contract to be in every single teen movie franchise ever. To my money, yes. So like, I really like, want to see him in Ready Player One somewhere. So I have like, two choices for Electro. I'm saying Dylan Minetti, if we don't ever get him for Harry Osborne, but if not, then this here's the definite go-to guy. I'm saying this is my go-to guy for this. Joe Curie. Joe Curie was uh, was the, the, the boyfriend from Stranger Things. You know, he's like the long-haired oh, okay. boyfriend. Right, right. He's in all the Ferris Bueller commercials they're doing now. That's the guy who I want for Scorpion, if I had to pick. Well, so the idea is like he's Electro. What did I say? You said Scorpion. Crap. Yes, I mean Electro. You know who sorry. Scorpion is. <laughs> I know. Yes, sorry. I meant, I meant, I meant Electro. No. Michael Mandau just sheds one single tear. He's like, no, 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 I got, I, I treat like me. <laughs> hey, I treat Mandau well. Oh, I, know, I, I know. treat. I, I got the Trey Mandau. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea of these two, these two, honestly, Spider-Man and Electro are very like-minded, being like kind of the young geniuses they are, because he's a genius. He kind of built like a web shooter setup with, with a suit here. He built the suit. And also, he has like a like a green helmet that has like a little face port so he could have like the mouth. So when basically when the electricity is crack, crackling, he would look exactly like the comic book Electro, which is cool. Nice, nice. So anyway, so they banter, they duke it out in kind of like a little ATM area, kind of like we saw what we saw at the beginning of Homecoming, a little homage there. Uh, they're, they're, they're duking it out. He's, uh, uh, Spider-Man's doing stuff like calling him Grinch again, guy in a green suit stealing around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. We get into like the Electro name. He basically explains, hey, the name's Electro. I mean, he came up with himself. He's very proud. Like this, he's so, it's like a kid testing out his new trick. That's kind of what he's doing here. Like his new bank robbing trick. Uh, he basically has a line that alludes to the origin. I don't know if this would exactly be the origin. Basically, this would be kind of explaining, like, hey, well, yeah, it's not the typical Electro. He has like a line saying, well, I was struck by lightning. And basically, Spider-Man's like, well, that, that's typical. Yeah, of course, you call yourself Electro if you're struck by lightning. This guy doesn't have all his marbles. <laughs> Uh, they both have like a moment where they geek out as like they're kind of saying, "Hey, man, cool suit." Says, "Oh yeah, I just basically, basically, oh, basically saying, hey, I built a built a web. Again, they're both science geeks. That's the idea. Right, that, right. Like, That's fun. like That's in fun. another life, these two could be best so pals. Basically, it's kind of like the Jamie Foxx version, but done tastefully and not done like with the creepy like autistic fanboy. <laughs> I think I wouldn't wouldn't go that far with it, but yeah, sure. I'll I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's so, you know, they're, uh, yeah, again, they're kind of bantering a lot. They're kind of like, you know, like, like snap out of it. Oh, wait, let's go back to fighting. Uh, okay, the, okay. the fight is then taken outside. It's winter in New York. You know, there's snow on the ground. It's not snowing, but there's snow on the ground. Spider-Man's commenting on the cold. He's, he's asking, hey, Karen, can you put the suit on thermal? It's a little chilly out here. She then tells Peter, and this is like a fun setup I'm proud of here. She tells Peter, yes, is there anything else I can do for you? You know, the suit can play Christmas music. It can. <laughs> nice, nice. Man, the suit really is the gift that keeps on giving. Karen <laughs> is then playing. Oh, Karen, you, you pick. Uh, Karen puts on, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> but basically, again, it's like a way of scoring the fight scenes of Christmas music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for so sure. they, they begin their, their fight again, more uh, more fight, more bands. Or like if there's a, the, again, now we're outside. It's so a different setting for all this. And they're kind of like changing. Again, we're not, in, we're not in like the greater Manhattan area. It's like we're on, it's very street level fighting. And we're, not, we're trying to do something a little differently than what we usually get. Or Bill, I think the second will probably give us more to the old stuff, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, Spider-Man suggesting, you know, if I were you, I'd, I'd get a holiday job instead of robbing ATMs. You ever thought of that, about that? <laughs> Pretty. Then basically this leads to, uh, the, the chase leads to Rockefeller Center. Okay. So at Rockefeller Center, and it's like kind of, I saw I got some inspiration from the Christmas episode of Spectacular Spider-Man here and there. So I'm kind of again, that's the best version of Spider-Man. So I kind of pulled here and there, but I made it my own. So uh, Spider-Man essentially he tries to blind and kind of stick Electro to the ice because he's unbalanced, like he keeps slipping in the rubber suit. Uh, unfortunately, it does not work. You know, he's like. It, it seems to work. He's like he's like disorienting, electrocuting him on the ice, but you're starting to slowly short. Yeah, short I, would, I was out. about to say like I, I would think that ice would be like you know like that's basically frozen water, so that wouldn't be good for electricity. That's that's the thing. Like initially, uh -huh. he, I forgot about that in the heat of battle. Then he's like he's like, Spider Man's trying to keep him there as he realizes okay, kryptonite. Uh, then he then grabs Spider Man's arm and he basically kind of electrifies the web shear so it fuses shut so it's like it's there but it can't shoot any web. And then he he blasts Spider Man directly like on on the symbol on the chest and. and 
what he does is he unfortunately he, he shorts out the suit, so now no care and nothing, no music, and he's like, oh, oh, you no. really are the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, Christmas music, darn it. Uh, anyway, he's dodging a few blasts. Spider Man again. He's no web shooters. He leaps to no no web shooters, no assistance. He leaps he leaps to the tree. And he's kind of sticking to the tree. Now the fight's on the rock on the giant Rockefeller Center tree. Oh, uh, you know he's kind of. It's going around down some things. Initially, he I have a lot of the advantage. tree scene as well, but that's in my act three. So, <laughs> that's cool. yeah, going to like new locations with Spider-Man. Oh, kind of, kind right, of cool. right. And, you know, he's, he's going around the tree, he can avoid blasts, and he thinks, okay, I have the advantage. Electro can't go on the ice. That means I'm safe. And then, then, then Electro gets an idea. Basically, he propels himself like an electrical field, kind of like Magneto. So now he can kind of he can levitate a little bit. So, but, oh man, there was just there, there was no Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I'm loving your Spidey quips. <laughs> and that line comes back. Oh man, there is no Santa Claus. Is there? <laughs> so uh, then, basically, it looks like you know, Spider. He's like grabbing bulbs from the trees. Like he's throwing, he's tossing them at Electro, kind of like a makeshift weapon. Like tossing, really like, breaking them on his head here and there. Uh, then he's like, oh man, how am I gonna get at this? Because he's gonna, he's gonna have a goner. But then he gets an idea. He sees the Christmas lights and he sees a Hydra behind Electro. So he gets an idea. He basically oh. he throws, he grabs some cr like strings of Christmas lights. He's using them as webs in a way. He throws one. He realizes, okay, if I throw these Christmas lights in his electrical field, they're gonna, they're basically they blow up like little, like little uh, flash bang bombs in his face, like bang, bang, kind of distracting him. So he then uses like another one to kind of swing his way across the, the ice. So he's on the other side of it where, where the hydrant is. Uh, and again, they they also blow up in his face and they distract Electro. He gets there, spider with his spider strength, and he rips off the uh, the end of the, of the hydrant as Electro is there, and he gets she gets shorted out himself. You know, one short out for another. Mm -hmm. Shorts that Electro, Electro's little days, Spider-Man then throws a snowball at his face, knocking him out. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Knock out. Let's see, so then after uh, after that action sequence, uh, you know, he ties Electro up in tinsel, you know, the cops are on the way, but uh, unfortunately, he then, Spider-Man then realizes he has no Karen, all his stuff is gone, and uh, he, again, he, no web shooters, and it's really cold out, because now it's this little heater, again, taking away sp the Parker luck is all throughout this thing, so, oh boy, now he's he's stuck in the cold, he has to borrow a phone, he has to, like, kind of borrow a jacket as he waits for Happy Hogan <laughs> to arrive, because he has to get the suit fixed, he has to go to Toby Stark to get the suit fixed. We then right. cut from like a limo arrives. We cut to the middle of the drip, middle of the drive where like Deck the Halls is playing on the radio. And <laughs> <laughs> there's this little bit where you see the Inspire Man head to toe in the mask. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Is Happy Hogan a Christmas music fan or is he like begrudgingly listening to Christmas music? I think it's just either or. It's like, yeah, it was just on the radio. It was just, you know, I think he just has the radio on. Okay, so he's not like into it. No, he's not. He's not a Scrooge, but he's like, you know, it's you know, it's it's, okay. it's very casual. Okay. Bit. Fair enough. Okay. So, anyways, then we have it's just this gag, of, like it's this timing gag. Of, like Spider-Man's so embarrassed, he's not. There's like it's silence between the two of them while Deck the Halls is playing, but then he, they <laughs> oh, stop. Like, he, he just, hey, do you mind? And basically, because Spider-Man's head the toe, kind of motions with him without saying the full thing. Hey, uh, do you mind? Like kind of motioning with his hand, like uh, remove the mask. He's, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. He takes the mask because <laughs> it's gonna look, kind of, it's gonna be like, look, look like he's Spider-Man chauffeur. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, like he's tired, like you're driving super people. Again, all the super people he knows, like, don't wear a mask around around. It's like kind of weird. It's like mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a realistic thing. Well, uh, it's also, you know, because Spider Man's a kid, so he doesn't really get the social grace of that yet. Exactly. Yeah. Like, what is this? Halloween? Take the mask. Come right. On. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Whereas, like, you know, that's kind of a funny play on like Marvel Comics, right? Where Marvel Comics, yeah. you just see these people talking to each other in masks like all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so, so let's see, you know, making some small talk, like, "Hey, happy, how's your how, how is your holiday going?" Uh, you know, happy's just saying, "Yeah, it's again, they're, it's kind of like older brother, little brother." It's kind of what we set up with the homecoming thing with, with Spider Man and then Happy Hogan. It's kind of like, uh, "Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's good. You got a Christmas and got a sweet Christmas bonus." But then uh, Happy says, "Well, there's just one thing. Basically, Happy's kind of opening up all his all his like his." his Spider-Man. Oh no! Oh god! Because the problem here is that I think it's small because he, he we know he trusts Spider-Man a lot more at the end of Homecoming than he did before. He, he likes the right. more. So he's opening up to him and he's saying, "Well, you know, it would be nice getting an Iron Man suit." 
I mean, everyone else got a suit. <laughs> Tony yes. got a suit. Yes. Oh my and God. Tony I got a suit. Rhodey got a suit. Pepper got to wear a suit. Yeah. Re yep. Referencing Iron Man three. And oh. All. <laughs> Just because hey, that took place around Christmas. Oh, I can totally see Favreau delivery that Pepper got to yeah, wear got a, a suit. Yeah. <laughs> got a couple. Of, got a couple of Iron Man three references because it was around Christmas time. Of course. And, of course. and Peter, uh, you know, Peter's like telling him, "Hey, hey, hey, man! It's not that he doesn't trust you with a suit. It's just he's protecting you, Happy. You shouldn't have to ever wear mm -hmm. a suit." Take, take, Take my word for it. That's, you know, Happy says, well, that was my job, protecting him. And, of course, I'm, I'm seating in some Aunt May setup here. Of like, it's about you protecting the people you love. Okay, okay. So it's like, well, that was my job. Anyway, it, it, Happy realizes, oh, thanks anyway, kid. I know you're trying. It's, uh, it's not going to. Yeah, it's kind of like a nice little back and forth between the two of them. Mm -hmm. We we cut to the next scene. So now we're at the Upstate facility. You know the Avengers. But you know, poor Tony's kind of monkey now because he sold Avengers Tower and his house got destroyed. In Iron Man three, so he doesn't really have any place. This place aside from aside from the Upstate facility. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, there's trying to make sure you get here. Uh, oh yes, a Marshmallow World is playing because you know it's like Tony Stark. Yeah, he's living in a Marshmallow World constantly. <laughs> he's just, he's just kind of playing that while he's working. The oh, dummy God. has like uh, the, the dummy has something like Christmas lights on the dummy. <laughs> nice, nice. You know, a little robot uh, thing. Hey, so basically, we have this little, nice little. It's a nice little casual scene here of Tony and Peter. Basically, while while Peter's fixing his web shooters, uh, Tony's fixing the suit. You know, from the electric, booting it up again, adding some you know, so it doesn't get electrocuted again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter's impressed. You know, again, very casually, Peter's impressed that Tony has like the the components he needs for the web shooter. Says, "Welcome to the North Pole, kid." Uh, he's, hey, Tony's like, "Oh, it's good to see you. Uh, it's good to see you in person around the holiday." I mean, I was, I was just going to call in, like, send you something, but it's nice to see you again, kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry about the glitch. I didn't expect you to go up against the real heavy hitters this fast. Again, hence the whole story of homecoming at the training wheels. He didn't expect to. He didn't expect to have to electric electric proof the suit. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, so he apologized for like the little glitch with, with that. Um, he says, "Okay, that ought to do it." So now it can't get you know overloaded again like like it did before. And then he says, "Oh, speaking of which, you know, the danger. Speaking of uh, getting electrocuted, and, uh, moving too fast. Take it easy out there. Will, will you? Your <laughs> right, aunt keeps right. calling happy at me. She keeps yelling at us. Oh just... God. Okay. Okay. That's great. <laughs> so basically, basically, May is treating Tony Stark and Happy Hogan like Peter's babysitters. Oh, it, it, you know, yes, and she's really mad at. She's especially oh, mad at Tony because, again, like, right, remember she had right. that scene with Tony in Civil War. And now she really, she's really mad at him because after the end of Homecoming, it's like. You did what? You built him a suit. What's oh, wrong with great. you? That's you great. <laughs> you stupid billionaire drunk idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm loving it. No wonder Captain America kept the crap out of you. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, you know, she's uh, she that is she keeps calling and checking on, being very overprotective and all, all that stuff. And mostly, well, yeah, she calls you. What she what she call you? That mostly yelling about yelling at me about this. He call, holds up the suit like a really annoyed man, like this. <laughs> um, let's see. Any, any, anything happens to you, I gotta find Banner and hire him as my new bodyguard. Oh man. Oh, that that's a storyline I want to see. <laughs> I gotta hire him as my new bodyguard in case I have to incur that woman's wrath if anything happens to you. <laughs> God. Right. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, I have, I'm really proud of this one where Peter's response, uh, you know, uh, Iron Man has a great line, which says, do us both a favor. Next time you dramatically put the suit on, close the door. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, and uh, Peter says, this coming from I am Iron Man. <laughs> you know, Tony's like, kind of like, what was that? Nothing? Nothing? <laughs> he doesn't want to talk. He doesn't want to talk down the big boss. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, but, you know, but seriously, you know, she's, uh, but seriously, she's getting... Uh, Peter then goes, says, "Okay, but seriously though, she's uh, she's getting used to Christmas uh, without my uncle." And uh, Tony again amps it down and says, "Yeah, I know how uh, how Christmas can be without uh, without someone can be." Basically, reference to the fact you know he lost his parents around Christmas time as well. So you know, a lot of, lot of stuff a lot of bad stuff happens to Tony around Christmas time. Now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's kind of like acknowledging. Yeah, it's. Uh, I understand. Again, he's. He's somewhat of a uncle. I have a few Uncle Ben figures in this special. Of course, Tony would be one of them. Just kind of a a, a placeholder for Uncle Ben. Of course, cannot fill the real thing. So, yeah, he's giving some words of wisdom here. He's just humble. Look, just just take it easy for all our sakes, okay? You know, he like Tony's the fun uncle. That's the gay. He's the fun uncle. We have kind of others of words of wisdom. Also, uh, here here, uh, 
early Christmas present, new phone, because again, he lost his phone, and hence the reason they had to borrow one. So, hey, new, new phone, Stark deck. Keep, take care of it. Don't lose it this time. And uh, have, a happy, uh, have a happy one, Mr. Parker. Uh, Peter is about to leave. Oh, one more thing. You should... Uh, you should let Happy try on a. You should probably let Happy try on a suit for Christmas. Did he say something new? <laughs> no, 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 no. Again, Peter's just trying not to make Happy look bad. He's like, no, no, no. Just uh, you know, he basically gives some sort of bad excuses. Merry Christmas, and he leaves. Nice, nice. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, okay, now we're checking in with uh, May. So May is watching on you, and you're gonna like this on YouTube. May is watching uh, Spider-Man versus Electric. Because yeah, everyone has a camera. Everyone's going, okay, right, right. And so and, like, oh, this was what Peter was doing today. How, how wonderful. Yep, it's uh, Spider-Man versus Electro on YouTube, and it's on the Daily Bugles YouTube channel. Oh, God. Of course it is. That's great. <laughs> uh, importantly, White Christmas is playing on TV. Okay. That's going to be important. Uh, Peter returns... Uh, she uh, she initially uh, she loses it. She's really she's very overprotective. Uh, yeah, like, oh, I'm sorry. Like he's uh, sorry. Let me refer, forget what I just said in there. So Peter returns and he like and she closes the uh, she closes like the so he so he doesn't know she's been she's been overprotective. That's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Little little video window. Um, so the idea is things are tense. Uh, she has no idea. They have, each of them are really kind of. They don't really have any idea what they kind of say with this Spider-Man. You know, the whole Spider-Man thing on the side. They're not quite sure like, how to how to approach going forward here. It's still, it's been kind of tense for the last couple of months. They've been doing day to day stuff. They haven't really kind of found a way to address like, hey, you're Spider-Man. Right. Right. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um. Uh, she she's asking what took Peter and like I want the truth. And Peter's saying, yeah, he's telling her the truth now because he has no other options. I had to get the suit fixed. After you little bath electro, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like that's kind of like. Did you skip doing your homework? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And did basically, you stay out late last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I have here is like she, like he's trying to uh, before she goes for the phone to call Tony Stark. Uh, before you lay in, before you lay in the Mister Stark, you know, uh, Peter owns up to it. Says, "Yeah, it, it was that was my fault. I was a little careless during the uh, during the fight." And again, May just doesn't know how to handle this kid anymore. She thought she did. Now she now she doesn't. And uh, and she's kind of they're kind of airing this out to Peter again. They're kind of broaching on the issue here. It's like, look, Peter, it's it's Christmas, and that's tough enough. You know, you're. Now I'm worrying about you, and your uncle was the one who really MVP'd the holiday. Now it's, yeah, now it's just me. Mm -hmm. We see a few photos of Uncle Ben, and we'll get like a very, very quick scene of Uncle Ben later on. But yeah, uh, for Uncle Ben, I have two actors in mind, uh, three if I need it, but two main actors. So I'll appeal through John Cusack, which I said, you know, I can buy John Cusack as Uncle Ben. I could, for, I this, could. For, a, I could. for a younger Uncle Ben, I could buy it. Right. And the one I'm going with, and the one I'm, I'm really thrilled about, Hank Azaria. Oh, I like Hank Azaria. Oh, that's a good one. Because the idea is with both these actors, I want like a real kind of like real New Yorker with it. I want Uncle Ben who's a, who's a little younger, well, kind that's of. That's going with with uh, Alfred Molina as well. Yeah. So the idea, like these, these two guys, like really grindstone New Yorkers, and I get that vibe a lot from Hank Azaria. I really liked him in Ray Donovan, so I give him, so I gave him a shot. Okay. So the idea is we see a few. Uh, uh, I think we see a few pictures here and there. Um, and those pictures be like you know, Peter and Ben at the Stark Expo when he bought him the helmet when he was a kid. Oh, yeah, he bought him the Iron Man helmet from that scene in Iron Man Two. So, uh, we see the, uh, the three of them at the Christmas tree. You know, the trio of you know Aunt, uh, Aunt, Uncle, and Peter at uh, at Christmas time, and just one of like you know her and Uncle Ben together. So again, a few photos like here, uh, here and there. Um, they kind of reflect for a moment. Hey, remember that. Uh, Peter's like, you know, just showing that he's he's receiving what Aunt May's kind of laying out there, saying, "Remember that that, that Nintendo he got me that one Christmas." <laughs> nice, nice. Oh yeah, he hauled the, uh, you know, he haggled for that like you wouldn't believe. Like, and the idea is like a real, real New Yorker, like kind of like he's he's got like he was like in a certain part of town. He found like, hey, I'm, he basically he got it for a good price. Uncle Ben was like, he was a real stickler. For that, <laughs> right, <sort> right. <laughs> Uh, so let's see. So uh, and and importantly, uh, May, while she wasn't really big, again, Uncle Ben was like the real jolly guy around Christmas time. She wrapped everything. He couldn't wrap anything to save his life. <laughs> uh, Peter holds May and just you know she's kind of like almost like almost cries into his shoulders and I miss him so much. Me too. Mm -hmm. 
okay, let's see. Peter's in his room. He's looking at like a small desk photo of or a screensaver of, of you know he and Uncle Ben together and uh, at, at the expo or like at the or at science camp or something that Peter and Ben did together. Uh, he gets an idea and he calls Ned for a mission and Ned's all excited. A mission, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, crap. Uh, I gotta mention this. Uh, the, re the significance of White Christmas and how it's going to come back. Uncle Ben loved White Christmas. That was his favorite, okay. that was his favorite Christmas movie. That's going to come back. Well, the man has good taste. And he loves the song White Christmas. So those two details are important. Okay, we go from the uh, we go from the snow outside to the whites of prison uniforms where we left uh, Scorpion and, and, and uh, Vulture and then the whole lot. That's the same prison we were at the ending of Homecoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, Mandow's laying in this awesome monologue about how he had plans for New York. He was he was working his way up the ladder. My 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 uh, vision of what uh, Scorpion could be is that going with the namesake is that he's a guy who has like a lot of connections and he wants power. And the, the minute he gets close to like one of the big bosses, he would strike like a Scorpion. He would then take over that guy. He wants. I like that. And the ultimate take on Scorpion, I can't, again, ultimate, but he would look like the classic version, is that he wants to be the next kingpin. So that's my that's my idea I'm, I'm running with, with Scorpion. This is a guy who wants who had vision to be the next kingpin. The guy's a smart guy. Okay. So let's see, he, uh, he wants to make his, uh, he's basically saying, he's monologuing to someone we're not seeing quite yet. He says, I had plans for New York. I was going to work my way up. You know, this one weapons deal that Spider-Man got in the way of in the Homecoming. Uh, that one weapons deal would have given would have given me the power to make my mark and scare the competition. I mean, Fisk left the vacuum. He left the vacuum. He's starting to reference the Netflix stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to bridge the gap, folks. I'm trying to bridge the gap, darn it. <laughs> Fisk, uh, Fisk this is left a special the... on Netflix, so that's kind of a good help right there. Yeah. So Fisk left the vacuum on the streets. Uh, full, a lot of small timers trying to fill that void because again, Fisk is in prison right now. That's where he, and then we set that up in the special, just in case anyone hasn't seen the Netflix shows. I know you guys have. I'm talking like just for the general public is playing for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, full of small timers and perspective. Uh, uh, basically, the people that Fisk didn't kill, and it's kind of the people are now trying to uh, kind of move in on Hell's Kitchen, some of the other territories in New York. I could have been the next kingpin, but that wall crawler. He ruined my shot at it. He ruined my shot at it, uh, like he did with yours. Like he did with yours. He ruined your big score. He's he's talking to this one guy. He ruined your big score. Will you help me get revenge on him, Flint? Oh, okay. He didn't reveal. Oh. This, this, is the ending of Act, this is the ending of Act One. He reveals. Right. It's reveals. It's the sand. I'm a, it's the Sandman. It's Flint Marco. We want, I, I'll explain. It's Thomas it. Hayden Church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but uh, speaking of that, I'm just going to describe my second same. The ending is the reveal of Flint Marco. But uh, my that's good. That's good, Dragon. That's a good hook. <laughs> so uh, this it, he isn't Sandman yet. This is like the idea from Spectacular Spider-Man. I really love the idea that Spider-Man ran into the, the the average bank robber Flint Marco a few times, and he busted him a few times. Uh -huh. So here, what I did with him to make Sam a little different from that, but I, I kind of kept to that idea is that this is a guy who is like the top bank robber. He okay. is like, he's a very smart, he's like as smart as Ant-Man is in terms of a heist. You know, he is a, he's, a, he's the top bank robber. He's very heist smart. He is, uh, he's very slippery. He's, 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 he's big, he is like, he's like, I, they don't call him this. I'm saying my, my idea for this. Uh, he's like, like sand slipping through your finger. You can't catch this guy. Oh, that's not. Nice. That's he's nice. slippery, and he's famous for being slippery. His is. I like how you straight. have really good juxta uh, justifications for the names, like the Scorpion and Sandman. Good job on that. Yeah, it's like you know the guy's an escape artist, and he's well known for improvising in the field, so he would get away. Uh -huh. And basically, he had a running streak of that. So, I mean, he he had a running streak of that. Like, he never has not completed a job. Like he's always gotten away with it, even if they they catch the loot, he gets away with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that that streak came to an end when Spider Man pinched him. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, that's uh, in terms of casting. I uh, uh, let's see. I had um, my, it, it, it's it's a stretch to see if we can get him, but uh, Woody Harrelson was one of was one of my go tos. I could see that. Woody Harrelson and uh, oh jeez, oh yeah, uh, Woody again. These are big. Uh, Woody Harrelson or John Hamm? Those are my my ideas. For some <laughs> again, a lot of baby driver for the John Hamm thing of like the clever bank robber, but right, uh, right, okay. Well, that's the ending of that one. Keep going. All right, so act two. Bone Saw is ready to have a fun cameo. 
Now, Dragon, of course, Bonesaw was played by the late, great Macho Man Randy Savage. May he rest in peace. So I'm going a little bit younger with this Bonesaw Dragon, all right? Now, I, I just want to play uh, role play with you for a little bit. Now, imagine that you're Kevin Feige, and you're browsing on the internet, and you're looking for up-and-coming talent. Like, you're looking for someone... You know, because, of course, the idea, like, we don't want to emulate Macho Man or Andy Savage. We just want someone in there to play the character, ideally a younger version of the character. And we don't know, we we don't want a known actor. Uh, so they're browsing. They come upon something called Super Academy. Oh, jeez. And they, they're just very, very taken by this Sloth Master character. And they're like, hey, gee, this... This Scott Reefer is a very talented individual, and he's got the posture that we'd be looking for, and he's also got kind of the composure that we're looking for with this bone saw. Now, Dragon, here's the idea with the bone saw. That, okay, so basically, bone saw in this version is he's a young entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneur wrestler who owns a wrestling ring. And, of course, in the ring, he's got the whole, like, Bonesaw is ready! You know, like, he's got that whole shtick. But um, outside the ring, he's freaking Scott Reefer. So, you know, he's just, like, very laid back and chill, you know, kind of like a, a Steve Jobs, like, hipster businessman, kind of, you know? Like, oh, hey, guys, thanks for stopping by. Oh, Peter Parker. Let's see. The human spider. Oh, yeah, I do remember you. All right. Hey, funny that right after you came by, that Spider-Man made his appearance. Ha, 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 ha. So basically, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm getting Scott Reefer in here just because I think Scott Reefer would do a really fun job of playing essentially what is a wrestler. I should do a Duck Washington. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Let, let's have Duck Washington in a cameo, okay? So, um... How about we'll pull some, we'll pull a couple more Super Academy guys, all right? So, so because I, I actually do have this written in, but I didn't cast them. But since you mentioned it, um, so a, and this sounds like something out of Super Academy too. So basically, while Peter is talking to Bonesaw, you know, trying to get the pictures, like basically just wondering, like, look, I know it's been like a year, but I was just wondering if you had any old pictures in the Lost and Found. And in the background, there's a Santa versus Frosty themed wrestling match. So, Dragon, uh, let's go ahead and make Alex Jeffrey Santa, and let's go ahead and make uh, Duck Washington Frosty. I'm down for Jeffrey Santa, man. I'm so oh, bad. I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> so that's happening in the background. And like I said, like I know it's a stretch. Like you know, just the hypothetical, like you know, Kevin Feige happened to stumble onto Super Academy, and then. Love Sloth Master. I mean, it's not that much of a stretch, but I don't know, man. Right, I mean, it's not that much of a stretch, sure. Yeah, okay. All right, but I, I just do like honestly, in terms of casting someone as as uh, you know as Bone Saw, it was a challenge because you know I didn't want to just have a Macho Man Randy Savage clone. I didn't want to have a known actor, and I and honestly, in thinking about what Scott can do as a performer. I think that Scott is, he's got a real talent for taking these sorts of absurdist characters that have two sides to them. So, you know, Sloth Master is a superhero, but he's also like super laid back. Oh, hi guys, I'm going to fight some crime. You know, and so basically the idea of this bone saw is that, you know, like he'll be announcing the match, you know, like, are you ready? Is bone saw ready to see Santa versus Frosty? And then, you know, and then we'd switch to, like, typical, like, Scott Reefer, like, oh, hello, Mr. Parker. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I could totally see Scott Reefer, like, pulling that off really well. Like, I could totally see him having fun timing on that. So, there you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, basically, the, uh, what we get out of this is that, is that the Vietnam photos were donated to a local art project. Okay. And so that's the clue that Peter gets. So yeah. then we get another day at school, and uh, Peter's searching. Uh, he's Googling for Vietnam-themed art projects around the city, kind of looking for different places that these photographs might surface for. Uh, Ned presents Michelle with a Lego, Def with a Lego Star Destroyer. And then uh, Michelle, you know, she's like, oh, thanks, Ned. 
you know, she's she's trying to be sweet about it, but she's like, I really don't care about Here's this. Here's a commitment. Right, right. <laughs> and then uh, I think you're going to like this. She does a really girly, like, and what did you get me, Peter? You know, kind of like, kind of like, you know, like flushes her eye, her eyelids, just, and then she's like, totes kidding, don't care. Nah, that's fine. Okay, that's, 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 that's consistent with that girl. I like oh. that. So, that's in day, all right. I like that to that girl. Mm -hmm. And also in class, uh, we take note that the stub where Connor's missing arm is is has a has a large bandage on it. There's a very conspicuous bandage over the arm. I see. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's see. So Peter is realizing, uh, looking around the mall, he realizes that he probably is not going to have enough time to buy Michelle that jacket because the whole idea is like he wants to get it for Michelle. I, I should have mentioned this up front, Dragon, but kind of one of the big selling points for me with this special was kind of the, uh, it's basically like the week leading up to a Christmas vacation in high school. So it's still very much centered on high school. It's just centered around a very specific kind of high school experience. For me, uh for me, like uh, like with thirteen reasons, thing mine is also on the Christmas. Um, mine's the week of Christmas. Mine's during the break. Mine is on yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, so essentially, what I have here is, uh, oh, let me see. So, essentially, the issue is, the issue is, he doesn't have until December twenty fifth to buy Michelle this present. Right, he has like a few days, and then they all go off you know, to spend time with their families over Christmas. So that's the idea. Like, they're school buddies. You know what I mean? Yeah, Anyways. yeah. Okay, so uh, then, um, Dragon, I blame you for this. All right? I, I just want to say right off the bat, I blame you for this. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, he takes up counsel with a mall Santa that he sees taking a break. And that mall Santa is played by none other than an uncredited Toby Maguire. An uncredited <laughs> Toby Maguire. See, that's one I can get behind because you don't even need to know that it's him. It's like you get it or you don't. That's what exactly. I so that's what and, I can and, appreciate. And he's it. behind the beard the whole time and everything. That's what I'm that's a classy way. That, that I can buy. I can buy that easily. Right, right. And this is a very simple conversation, but Toby's just like, just get her, just get her something from the heart, kid. And Peter's frustrated. He's like, I know, that's what I've been saying, Santa. And this jacket is from the heart and it's too expensive. And then Toby's like, whoa, whoa, back up a little kid. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we get kind of like a fun back and forth. Okay, so a robbery breaks out, Dragon, and Peter goes for his suit. Uh, we have a good halfway point scene with uh, Peter as Spider-Man kind of uh, stopping the barrage of Santas as they have them, uh, you know, like he's stopping. It, basically, it's kind of like the Santa mask, right, where we have like a bunch of criminals in Santa suits, like robbing the mall. Yeah, yeah. And so he's, uh, you know, he's basically just swinging – uh, just hanging all these Santas by the by the second story ledges of the of the mall, <laughs> and uh, so you know it's just a nice kind of fun action scene. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, okay. So uh, Peter lost his uh, he lost his backpack full of street clothes. So you're gonna yeah. love this dragon. You're gonna love this. He's forced to take the elevator up to a department clothing store. And of course, the classic Spider-Man for have been forced to take the elevator. And who else walks in but James Franco? Oh God, is is he actually James Franco? Or is he another character? No, he's he's just a tourist. He's a random New York tourist, right. and he's an obvious tourist, right? Like he's you know, like you can tell, like he's got like a camera around his neck and everything. But Dragon, the uh, uh, you know. The cherry on top of the pie. Oh god! <laughs> is that he's going to be wearing a tenth annual Queen's Pie Eating Contest T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> and then you know he's just like, "Hey, cool, cool suit." And then Peter's like, "Thanks." My aunt co competed in that pie eating contest once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's how you do the pie joke. And then, of course, of course, um, you have to have the line. You have to have Franco just looking like lustfully into the camera and just being like, 
Oh, this, the pie was so good. <laughs> it's be kind of like one of those you wouldn't believe if someone told you about these New Yorker type guys. Like, right, right, exactly, exactly. That's the I idea. swear to God, he looked to an imaginary camera and he said, <laughs> <laughs> "Oh God, oh God." Okay, so we see Spidey with a list of Vietnam art projects. He's going throughout the city, and then he spots a huge mosaic. Now, of course, dragging a mosaic is a bunch of little photographs uh, put together to form a bigger photograph. And this mosaic, yeah. of course, is just of, uh, it's basically an, a mosaic of the American flag as part of a Vietnam memorial. And sure enough, Uncle Ben's photos are hidden within the mosaic. And Peter is attempting to scrap, to scrap the photos off the wall, but he is stopped by none other than Stan the man Lee as a World War II vet. Uh, as a World War II vet, of course. Yeah. He's like, now, son, I might not have served in the Vietnam War, but I served in WW2. Is this the same guy from uh, from Age of Ultron? I, I'm sure, if you want it to be. Well, actually, well, we know they're all technically the same guy, but you know what I mean. It's, uh, right, right. <laughs> I mean, come here, we had a we had a World War II veteran in Age of Ultron. That was his cameo in that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Sure, it could be. Yeah, let's make it the same guy. Yeah, sure, here, here, sure. Here. Okay, and basically he's like, you know, son, I bet Captain America went to prove of you vandalizing that <laughs> war monument. And then basically, uh, of course, Peter shoots back. Isn't that guy a war criminal? <laughs> and then we smash cut to a Captain America PSA. Uh, it's the next day. Of course, the coach is making them. So basically, uh, Cap is, uh, you know, he's basically like, and remember, kids, be thankful for what you have, because the troops, we get rations for Christmas, and we're <laughs> fighting for your Christmas presents. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's basically like a lesson of, like, you know, like, if you don't think your Christmas presents are great, like, the troops are out there, you know, like, they don't have a Christmas, so be thankful for what you got. You know, that's kind I'm, of the idea. I'm jealous because, I, because again, mine's not at the school, so I don't have any Captain America. Okay. But, uh, yours, okay. I'm, I'm jealous of that and yours. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, let's see, Dragon. I've got a couple more beats until the until the close. Like I said, mine goes around, goes along at a rather quick pace. Um, okay, so... Uh, so basically, it's uh, Ned and Michelle are kind of growing closer together, and Peter is sort of becoming that awkward third wheel, and Peter's sort of becoming you know, a little bit down on that. Um, he also remembers uh, that he forgot to turn his homework into Connor, so he rushes back to Connor's classroom. And here, Connor's still watching home videos of his family around Christmas time. You know, it's dark. Uh, we get the uh, we get the idea that after. That after he lost his arm, he put him, himself into exile for them. Now he's desperate. Uh, so basically, he unwraps the bandages, Dragon, and he reveals a half-grown arm, like a mutated, deformed, half-grown human arm. And he he gets out a serum, you know, and he gets out, like, a needle, and he's like, don't worry, Billy. And, Dragon, I gotta say, this line's chilly, but I'm... Uh, this line's cheesy, but I'm kind of proud of the... Don't worry, Billy. And then he injects himself with the serum. I will be home for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Peter watches this as Connors is like starting to transform. Like basically what's happening is that the uh, the small arm is growing over with the lizard arm. And then the lizard arm is kind of acting as like a, a rapidly spreading tumor across the rest of his body, like kind of like, you know, like like swallowing it, like the lizard skin. And yet somehow he still keeps his lab coat on because we need to have that lab coat as a visual cue. God damn it! All right. <laughs> so just the, I well, mean, the it's just ripped and tattered. It's still there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like we need to have it on. And so basically, uh, basically the lizard sees Parker. And he speaks, Dragon. Right? In this version, we have the lizard is actually very intelligent. Uh, and he's like, Parker, you really need to stop sneaking into my class after hours. And then that's the cut. Okay. End of act two. Like I okay. said, Dragon, mine goes along at a pretty brisk pace. So. 
right. Okay, act two for me. Okay, so we, we pick up in the prison, so we continue the conversation. Marco's asking for clarification, and we get some a little bit of exposition with character here. Is that... Uh, uh, we get some. We're exposing some details so we kind of know how the Sandman operates. You know, this proto, you know, pre-Sandman, you know, before he gets the powers. Uh, yeah. He, uh, let's see. Uh, Scorpion wants uh, Gargan wants him to kill Spider-Man publicly. That's what he wants because he wants him to be humiliated and killed. That's that's the thing because basically everyone has a camera now. So if he fights Spider-Man, you know, it will be, be done publicly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he makes it clear. Look, I'm a bank robber. I'm not a hitman. You might want to go to someone else for this, <laughs> right? Uh, let's see. So then he, uh, well, yes, but I need your expertise and your improvisation. That's the only way you get this guy. You know, with a heads up. And you know, uh, basically, uh, let's see. Uh, Marco's come back at him with, uh, look, you give if you give me a heads up, I, I could probably you know escape the prison. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, Gargan is saying, hey, with a heads up, you probably could escape the prison or even break me out. But, you know, we don't, we don't have time for that because you, we don't have – basically, I don't have time for that. And you, thanks to me – got you. And there's a, little, there's a little bit of a Better Call Saul reference here. Thanks to me, I got you that lawyer that got you tried separate from your cronies. Right, right, nice. So basically, the, so the reason he's going to Sandman here and not asking for, like, a breakout or anything is because Sandman's getting released today. Hmm. Uh, and he's in debt to he's indebted to the Scorpion for that. So again, he owes him a favor because of that. So that's why he's going to the Sandman of all people. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, and I mean, in an hour, you're walking out of here. You owe me. Yeah, I owe you. So look, pulling the like, I don't care. Look, here's what you do. You, I'll give you a few of my guys. I'll give you a few of my guys. You know, a few of his kind of low level cartel guys. I'll give you a few of my guys. You get your guy O'Hearn. You're gonna love who O'Hearn is. You get your guy O'Hearn. I don't care who pulls the trigger, you know, but the Emirates, even if you do, it's for the greater good. One kill and New York, uh, and New York is ours. It's ours for the taking. There's no heroes left to take us out here. They're, the Avengers are busy and taking out like the, the, the high level stuff. And, uh, yeah, I remember when the Netflix shows right now all around Christmas, uh, all the, uh, all the other characters like, uh, Iron Fist may not, uh, Iron Fist is in Kunlun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daredevil uh, is the one detail I have confirmed for Defenders that Iron Man uh, is sorry, the one detail I have confirmed for Defenders is that Daredevil is kind of be semi-retired right now. Uh, Jessica Jones, that's eh, more PI than hero, and Luke Cage, of course, is in prison, so there's no one on the streets right now. No one on the streets. Only the Avengers and the high level stuff. Right, right. Aside from Spider Man, so that's the logic. We take out Spider Man. New York's ours. Makes sense. Uh, you know, again, you know, we, you know, we, um. Basically, with some muscles, some intellect, you know, some muscle, some planning, some intellect, we could own this place. We could own this city. We have a deal. They shake on it. What do you need? I'm um, gonna need guns, smoke bombs, mask, uh, a few guys. Which of course we to get those. Any technology? We have what, what technology we got? Do we have anything special on this? It says, uh, well, let's ask Tombs. You go to Tombs. You go to, so we have our Keaton. We have two bits of Keaton in this. Okay. Go to tombs. Uh, let's see. We, we there's a fun gag I put in here. So we see Tombs is watching on the prison television. Well, they're all kind of forced up watching. They, he's he's watching Jack Frost, which he's in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it's Keaton as a snowman, but he's watching. He's watching. He's he's just kind of watching Jack Frost. Uh, they ask him about Mason. Of course, Phineas Mason, the tinkerer who we who builds all the technology in the, in kind of the MCU for the Spider-Man villains that we've established, which I think is really cool. And I always like kind of having some reference here. That's they, they're asking about Mason. Hey, uh, Tombs, I know you, you don't know who Spider-Man is, but do you have any way of contacting Mason? Mm-hmm. We use him for a job. And what what he's doing here is he's uh, Vulture is kind of lying with the truth here, as he's saying. Mason's a smart guy. He's probably keeping his head down. There's no way to find him, even even by me. I can't if I can't I can find him if I wanted to. And again, the idea is he's protecting Peter with that, but at the same time, you kind of buy it that Mason would be hard to find. He is a smart guy, keeping you know, keeping his nose clean. Hmm. All right. So then, uh, the Scorpion said, "Well, okay. Well, O'Hearn's going to need his his, uh, his famed suit." And the idea is O'Hearn's a guy that that uh, is a friend of the Sandman's who. Who's famous for wearing a, a specific suit uh, in the bank jobs? Like these two guys that work together, and he has a suit that makes him quite formable for all these like famous bank jobs they've pulled. You're gonna see what that is. Uh, 
Tombs, you got a visitor. You know, guards call him Tombs. And Tombs leaves, and we have this really sweet little brief scene, like kind of a punctuation of the scene where the uh, vulture is visited and surprised by Liz and her mom. Yeah, let's see. We get to see uh, Tombs like a loving father. He's he's rewarded for protecting Spider Man. That's kind of that's, that's kind of the the idea is like they trekked all from where they moved to to kind of visit him in New York, just you know because they love their you know they still love him the pieces. And uh, he's like, I'm so surprised you guys are here for me. You could have just called. Well, no, it wouldn't be Christmas without you. And then then Keaton sheds a single tear. And I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. So um. Yeah, you know, it's like a little, uh, you know, a little bit there, and again, kind of like the kind of that Uncle Ben figure we had somewhat in Homecoming with the Vulture. So again, a guy looking out for Peter, but at the same time, he has family. He wants to see around the holidays. They haven't forgotten. Again, kind of ushering in like a theme here with that. So, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Scorpion kind of says to uh, Scorpion, kind of punctuates the person by saying, "Spider Man dies before Christmas." Ooh. Cut two. <laughs> the mall. Uh, it's the mall. If I have to pick a specific place, I'm guessing Macy's. I wanted to say Gimbal's, but Gimbal's isn't around anymore. Let's just mm. say it's 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 Macy's. Just a mall type area. Big old department store mall area. Fancy mall. Mm. Uh, and again, different location for Spider-Man here. Uh, it's it's the, it's the week of Christmas. There are a few days before Christmas. It gets like Spider-Man dies before Christmas. Uh, we cut to the mall saying, just a few more days till Christmas, shoppers. Yeah, the announcement of Christmas is the again the clock is ticking. We reveal that Ned and Peter at Macy's. Peter, I thought you said you had a mission. This is just Christmas shopping. Actually, let me redact that. Actually, what I had is okay. He reveals that we, Ned and Peter at Macy's. Ned is taking this very seriously as a mission. He's taking this very seriously as a mission. Uh, because again, guy at the chair now in the field. So he's, he's this is a big step for him. Uh, it's revealed that they are they're looking for uh, for a gift you know we think they're gearing up for a mission where Peter reveals no we're actually we're doing Christmas shopping to help Aunt May but also we're looking for a gift for at the same time we're kind of we're, we're helping alleviate the stress of the holidays for Aunt May hmm. which is nice uh, okay let's see so basically they're doing some Christmas errands they're getting some Christmas errands done for a while looking for a, while Peter looks for a gift Ned's checking the list twice <laughs> There, uh, he's checking the list. He checks it a second time, and basically, what they're getting is you know, some holiday food, some decorations, uh, and and fruit cake. Nice. Uh, nice. Fruit cake, lights, and a gift. That's essentially what they're. You know, they have. I'm sorry. They have the. They have the food. They have the decorations. All they need now is fruit cake, lights, and a gift. Okay. okay let's see. So the, we have a montage. We need a montage. A montage. A montage. Yes, uh, so the montage... When you need to find scenes in this executive order and you need to have it go real fast. You need a montage. I'm sorry, go ahead. We have a montage with the, uh, the Nutcracker Suite. You know, the amped up version of Nutcracker Suite we got from like uh, Jingle All the Way. You know, like a dun, 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 dun. It's kind of an over-the-top comedic scene. So we have that playing as the two of them split up and they're kind of doing their doing their stuff. Peter's oh, using his agility to avoid being trampled. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all, all the people want to rush around the holidays. We have a few sold-out items again for the gift for Aunt May. It's like, ah, I've like, like looking at clothing outlets and antiques. Like, darn it. <laughs> it's a, all sold out or someone like getting the last one uh he's uh but then he's in front of let's say a radio shack or like an appliance place a place he's gonna make something at the end here so the point is he's in front of a store like a radio shack or something he gets an idea and he, he we enters and then we we cut back to the outside here where we're in a van we're in a van so they need a vehicle too so like uh, for the uh, for the job here they're about to pull the you know the kill spider-man job mm -hmm. so we're in a van we meet o'hearn alex o'hearn uh, who is, uh, and I, I borrowed this from Spectacular Spider Man because I love it. I love the idea that uh, Flint Marco and Alex O'Hearn were buddies. And they pull, and they, were, they work together a lot. Spider Man busts them a lot. So the idea here is that O'Hearn, and just so everyone knows, O'Hearn is, uh, O'Hearn is the rhino. Okay, okay. So here's, here's the gig. So I love, I love you cast Paul Giamatti. I mean, come on, who else would you cast? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bind with O'Hearn because I only had two names, but again, whether we'd be able to get them or not, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I have a, a Vinny Jones because I love Vinny Jones. Oh, I love Vinny Jones. He'd make a great rhino. <laughs> uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny Jones, and uh, if not Vinny Jones, then uh, possibly uh, – I'm trying to think who I uh, got. Um, I'll uh, – I'll come, I'll come to it later. I'll remind you. But let's just say okay. Vinny Jones. I have like another. 
Or oh, oh, no, I know my guy, I'm my perfect guy would be if I could get him. Because he's, he's working with DC right now on, on TV. He's uh, Dominic Purcell, you know, Link from Prison Break, who was a. a, a He's a heat wave on the Flash, remember? And now he's on Legends of War. That's my guy if I had to pick anyone for the Rhino. But, uh, you know, him or Vinnie Jones would be my two go-to guys. All right. So, O'Hearn. Here's the, here's the story with O'Hearn. Here's, like, the fame suit. He basically, he pulls out a suit here, and, like, you know, the, we have, like, our extra cartel guys. We have about four cartel guys with, you know, basically just gun-toting men wearing masks. That's all they are. Uh, they're asking, like, what's the deal here? They pull out the, the fame bulletproof suit that Sandman and Rhino kind of came up with together. And the idea is they were inspired by the dash cam footage. And they exposit this somehow. They say uh, they were inspired by the dash cam footage of Luke Cage getting shot uh, shot by the cops and he's throwing them across the, across the way. Mm-hmm. So he was inspired by that footage. Basically what they did is they melted Kevlar vest they stole from cops down together. And uh, they added, so they, they sewed some weights into, like, some armbands, so basically he could charge and, like, kind of have the strength of a rhino. <laughs> nice. Hang on, like, he's not called rhino, it's the idea he would charge like a rhino, and that's, a, like, I have, like, a little reference, like, what, it's a reference to what his future could be. He's like a proto-rhino right now, so I'm kind of, pre- like, an, intermedi- an intermediary stuff, so we're setting the groundwork for a lot of this in the future, if they want to, like, officially introduce the rhino. <laughs> Uh, and again, it's like we had the Russian rhino and the Amazing Spider-Man. This is the American rhino. This is the New Yorker rhino, which I, I like better, to be honest with you. But, uh, okay. Okay. Let's see. So, so yeah, basically, he's putting on a suit. They're all they're getting ready for the job. Uh, essentially, they uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Marco's giving them uh, giving them the task. Uh, the idea is they're going to stir up enough trouble in, in Macy's that they're going to lure Spider-Man there. And you know, the idea is we're not going to kill anyone unnecessarily. We only need to kill Spider-Man. Uh, the idea is you know we we. Uh, O'Hearn and I will, will uh, steal from a few outlets. Again, there, a lot of alarms will be triggered, which will definitely put a signal out there. Then uh, if, if he doesn't show up, then we're going to open some – you guys open fire to the ceiling, you know, act like we're going to take some hostages. No casualties, but it will be bound to draw Spider-Man, and then we'll, we'll have it the rest of the plan. So that's the mm-hmm. plan. Just draw him out, and then they're saying, wait, so you're using us as bait? And then O'Hearn, again, sticking up for his buddy here, big big guy, like, again, like a Vinnie Jones statue guy. He steps in mm-hmm. front and says, you got a problem with that? Nope. <laughs> I'm just there, terrified. Okay, now back in the mall, we have a very brief scene with uh, Peter. And again, we're like they're at the same, they're at Macy's, and they're about to go in there where, where Spider Man is right now. So again, it's kind of like a, a it's a tense thing right now. It's like oh god, and Spider Man's there, so he's he's going to be walking right into their trap. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> so they bump into Michelle. Michelle's like at the food court or someplace, and then she's like kind of playing it nonchalantly, like hey. Uh, Oh well, oh Michelle, what are you doing here? Uh, you 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 doing some Christmas shopping? No, I'm not going to do some like Christmas shopping. Look at these yuppies here, you know, like going to all these stores and everything. Like a, a beat goes by and says, "Well, okay, I'm waiting for a few outlets to open because they're they've been sold out of stuff and they're about to get some new shipments in." But you know, different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm boiling it down because I can't write for Michelle worth anything. <laughs> but one thing I do have written down is that she draws her and says, "Well, so I'm drawing like all the all the all the kids." Uh, Drawing like the varieties of uh, of kids on Santa's lap over there, and we see uh, like you know some of them are freaking out, some of them are like really happy go lucky. So she's like drawing like the misery of people again mm-hmm. with uh, our mall Santa. And our mall Santa is Stan Lee. Oh God! Okay, okay, nice. Yeah, but we like we see over there just like saying you know, like uh, saying you know, you know saying something along the lines of "What would you like for Christmas, little girl?" You know, it's very like yeah, he's like he's talking to the kids, and the kids are liking him, but they also have a few like ah, why. Well, yeah freaking out so. mm-hmm. okay let's see uh it's all right it's, um okay so uh, okay peter uh peter's arm hairs then suddenly stand up and again like the spider sense is kind of going kind of the non-conventional spider sense we got going on here uh he notices men entering again the the uh, the masked gunmen like, they're about to enter and like they're about to stir up some trouble he can sense this he makes a quick excuse to leave and says isn't that right ned uh, and Ned's like a little slow in the uptake, and he, you know, he tells uh, Michelle, "You and uh, you know, you should go with Michelle. You, should, you guys should uh, uh, basically, you guys should, should probably uh, get out of here for a while." Essentially, that's kind of what he's wasting. Ned's a little slow in the uptake. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, Michelle. Let's get, let's get going here. Let's, let's, let's walk around a little bit. <laughs> okay, so now the alarms are going off. The gunfire is going. I'm going to try to speed past a lot of this action. You know, the arm, alarms going off. They have gunfire. We have hostages about to be taken. Spider-Man swings in. 
Uh, we have like, a brief thing with Stan Lee, the mall Santa. He's like shielding children, homaging like his early cameos and then the Raimi Spider Man. You know, he's like shielding children. And the point is, we have a really good guys of Santa Claus here. Hmm. Uh, your Spider Man takes out the gunmen again, uh, you know, saving the saving the people. A lot of saving going on there. Marco was in a striped, uh, a green striped jacket, by the way, so we can get like the Sandman look. Oh yeah, a oh yeah, where, right. <laughs> so, again, like classic thing going on there. And of course, um, holiday colors as well. Very festive. Yes. Oh yeah, uh, Karen shows Peter the new Spider Sense feature. I'm proud of this. So the idea is kind of we have like a POV shot of Spider Man now. So when he he can basically his Spider Sense would be like a red light with a Spider Sense sound effect that would go off like uh, kind of Iron Man's. You know when we cut an Iron Man's helmet. <laughs> we wouldn't see his face in the helmet. We see like through the spider eyes what he's seeing, and it'd be like okay, like red light, Spider Sense danger. That's kind of it's kind of new, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I like that. Okay. So let's see. So again, we have a few red POV shots of like of the action going on there. He avoids the charging rhino. You know, like, again, those like bustling towards him, you know, like, you know, like smashing a few kiosks. Uh, the police enter, they start firing at the rhino, and again, uh oh yeah, I should mention based on the Luke Cage thing, it's basically it's he has like the the the, the armor thing underneath, but he's wearing the gray hoodie, so again, rhino you know, again, like Luke Cage, like it's it's the bulletproof hoodie that inspired the idea. So oh. Bulletproof okay. hoodie armor. So, like they shoot again, nothing's happening, and then he's the cover guy. Like, you know, they would shoot at him while the other guys would get the advantage shooting at the cops. Spider Man steers the charging, uh, the, uh, the the charging rhino away. He, it's basically so he's uh, steered away from the cops who isn't like going you know, to charge at him. Mm -hmm. Marco's throwing a few flashbangs at the track, Spider Man disorienting him. Uh, let's see the. Um, Oh yes, the song that's playing. Karen puts a song on. The song playing throughout the scene is "It's the most wonderful time of the year." It's the most wonderful time of the year. While well, everything's going chaotic around them, <laughs> you know, men are going for uh, you know, men are going for their guns. Uh, Spider Man webs up the guns. Uh, we have uh, um, basically uh, he, he kind of Chinese finger traps two guys. So basically, as he basically attaches them to each other, like like a finger, uh, you know, like the old uh, finger traps. You know, like you get your, your finger stuff. Mm -hmm. into. Kind of like that, so they're kind of webbed together. Like, ah, oh, get away from me! It's like it was like a tug of war almost. We have one guy pulling a knife, you know, like a knife wielding guy is distracting as a uh, distracting Spider Man. Well, they feel like you know, Spider Man's dodging with a spider sense, of course. Uh, he's distracted uh, as the rhino returns. Oh, god, <laughs> throws Spider Man through, uh, through the display, through like you know, the uh, the the sand of display. He crashes right through the sand of the display. He saves some people from, from some falling debris because he hit like a support beam. Uh, he's dodging bullets. Uh, he uh, Marco uh, tries tasering Spider Man, thanks to Iron Man's upgrade, does not work. He says, Yeah, I'm not, uh, it doesn't work on me anymore. He then taser webs Marco right in the, ch the, right in the face. <laughs> Zaps the crap out of Marco. Rhino's, uh, Rhino punches Spider Man right into a store. You know, he's. Uh, um, oh yeah, he oh, punches him into the fruitcake store. He punches him right into the fruitcake oh, store, and then Spider-Man hits hits Rhino with a fruitcake right upside the head, like a whole like <laughs> thing of fruitcakes fall on him, you know, really heavy. Uh, he then tosses Spider-Man so far he tosses him across the room into Flint Marker. So the two of them are like into like go through like they bolt through like a couple doors into a construction area, like a, a, an area of Macy's that's still under construction. There we get some Sandman references here. So. He tosses him like the construction part, the parts on the construction. Uh, Marco like hits him with a bag of cement, and like he's covered in dust, and he can't see for a second. There, again, kind of like the Sandman dust, the little you know the sand in his face. Uh, he attacks him with a sledgehammer. You know he's a spy, uh, He's attacking Spider with a sledgehammer. He kind of dodges a few times. Spider Man like he's thrown for a loop, and he grabs it and he like breaks the tip off. He then, in a bind, because again he can improvise on the job like this. Sandman grabs a sandblaster and he, you know, like, you know, oh he God. Kind of, like, the schmaltz and stuff away when malls are under construction. They blast Spider Man right in the face. Ooh, ooh, God. Oh, sandblast them, and basically that's it. He, he notices the police are starting to fill the room, so now it's time to get out. So he's using that sandblast as a way of getting out because, again, he's a slippery guy. Mm hmm. He's, he's like radio, like using like the radio or something to tell. Oh, her, listen, we gotta get out of there. It's time to go. But the job, there's no time. There's too much heat. We gotta get out of here. And then, of course, oh, Hearn being his pal, you go. I got it. I got it. I'll take care of the job because he knows how much this job means to the sand because he, he's indebted to a guy. Mm -hmm. Spider Man timer webs uh, the rhino attacking. And basically, a few little timer webs, you know, like the thing where you webs them and big web bomb. 
So basically, he he uh, sticks the, the the rhino. So now he's uh, he's stuck and he, he crawls on him a few times. Um, I'm sorry. He, he like he hits him with this. He crawls on him. Basically, he hits him with a few more, and then basically he is adhered to a a, a kiosk full of plush stuffed animals, and on top of his head, all knocked out, is a stuffed rhinoceros. Oh God, <laughs> nice. Uh, Spider-Man tries chasing uh, chasing Marco down. Marco again, he has like parkour on his sides. Again, the guy's really slippery. He's using parkour, like jumping over things. Uh, he's hitting some fire alarms, and basically the water is creating cover. So you know the water is coming down from the fire from the sprinklers. Mm-hmm. Again, kind of again, kind of hard to see him now as he's getting further and further away. Uh, Marco uh, Marco escaped. Uh, he's like he, he lost him, and uh, he's seeing O'Hearn being led away. Marco's peeved, like oh man, now my buddy's gone. It's all my fault. Uh, Marco gets a call from this is the end of this is the end of uh, okay. Marco gets a call from Gargan uh, with a uh, with a coded conversation because the calls of the jail are being monitored. Of course, uh, the calls in the prison are being monitored. And he's like, here's what he's coded. He's giving him a coded message. We're going to find out in Act Three. Um, our pest problem is not solved. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's, still, that's not too hard to figure out. With I, I'm, I'm still going with it. I'm okay, saying, I'm that's sorry, it. Mark, Marco says that to him, basically saying, hey, okay. Spider-Man isn't dead. You still owe me one for last time. You still owe me for last time. He gives him new instructions with this code message, and here's the new instructions. So again, it's not about publicly humiliating Spider-Man. It's about just, just killing him now. Uh, instruction is, go to the kitchen, get the turkey in the drawer with the sil- then in the drawer with the silver where there's a number for an exterminator. Don't let me down. Oh. Hangs up Marco. Oh. Marco exhales. And I forgot one last thing. This is important. This is like the last scene in this section. It's a, it's a Peter and Aunt May. It's the last thing. And this is like the big. So again, the point is, he has to, same man has to find a hitman. I think I know where this is going and I'm jealous. Okay, let's see. Uh, Okay, so Peter uh, returns to an to an upset Aunt May, showing footage, uh, showing him footage from the mall fight, which is really dangerous. Getting a lot of guns blazed and everything. There's a lot of chaos at that mall fight. Uh, you know, at Macy's, mm-hmm. they were um, basically even Aunt May realized they were baiting you. You realize how dangerous that is. You know, Peter standing his ground here, saying, "Look, I had to do this." You know, again, like people are in danger. I had to say, "What do you want me to do?" I didn't raise you for this. Again, it's really getting really heated between two. I didn't raise you for this sort of thing. If they're if they're um, look, if they're coming again, Peter's trying to turn us to like an adventure. Look, if they're coming for me, that means I'm doing a good job. Which means again, I'm like, I'm I'm actually being a hero. They're actually going for me here. Oh, God. So, <laughs> what's your end goal? Death? Is that is that victory for you? You know, Aunt May's kind of firing back at him here. Mm-hmm. You know, both to uh, you know, they're both kind of going to a head here, and then basically they look at and it was like the two of them like on either side like looking really peed at each other, and then there's a photo of Uncle Ben in the middle. They look to and they're like. Phew, you know, they kind of like they're. Peter leaves the house and he's just like, you know, I'm just, I, I've had this. I'm, I'm through. Just, they're really mad at each other. It builds to an argument. That's the end of Act Two. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's jump right back into my Act Dragon. Of course, we start things off with a an abrupt fight scene through the school with Spidey versus the Lizard. Except the one big change here is that Spidey is not Spidey Dragon because he doesn't have the costume on hand. He is just Peter Parker. So basically what this amounts to is kind of an elaborate an elaborate chase scene where basically what Peter Parker is doing is he's using his spider senses to make it look like he's just being incredibly lucky to avoid the lizard as he's being chased by him, which leads to kind of a comedic, like, you know, like a comedic reaction from some people like, oh my God, Parker. Oh, wow. Oh my God. Can he, he's, he's out running that lizard thing. You know, like you see Parker kind of like jumping around and ducking and stuff like that, you know, like, so basically it just, it looks like he's really lucky, but we know he's using the spider sense. Um, okay. Let me see. Sorry. Let me scroll up a little bit. Um, and of course lizards in the traditional lab coat, obviously. (laughs) Um, now, Peter's goal is he gets the he gets the lizard out onto the football field because that's the place, uh, you know, th- that's a good kind of anonymous place where, you know, there's no there's nothing going on there right now. There's nobody there. It's a wide open 
you know, it's a wide open space. Uh, he gets, he goes to the football field, but not before they have a run in where the lizard goes into his classroom and there's a group of students that are hit out in the classroom, including Michelle and Ned. All right, Dragon. Now, this is important. We're going to set up some big backstory here. Now, Ned defends Michelle. Like, the, the lizard lunches after Michelle. Ned yeah. defends him. And the lizard swipes a, uh, basically, a, a beaker that's filled with acid onto Ooh. Ned's face. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so Ned is like, ah! Oh! You know, like he's like, you know, an ambulance is called. Like, and of course, he's not the only person who's going to the hospital, you know, because the lizard, he's ripping through the school. So there's quite a few people in the hospital, including Ned with this acid on his face. Um, okay. And so basically, uh, Spider Man, like I said, Peter gets the lizard to the football stadium. Then he goes to the locker to get his Spidey suit. And then he wings into the stadium, and, and Spider Man and Lizard have a fight within the stadium. And it ends with the Lizard being kind of being hung up between the, do, the two field goal, goal posts on the football field. All right. And you'll notice this is kind of, of a reoccurring thing with me is like hanging up the villains. Like basically, it's like Spider Man giving the police presents. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. So that was so really dragon the big action set piece kind of comes kind of comes at the beginning of act 3 and the rest of act 3 is kind of like an epilogue sort of like aftermath stuff so I just I know it's kind of an odd structure to have that set piece be uh you know kind of soon into act 3 but I I think you'll like what I've come up with for the resolutions here okay so peter delivers uh another another bunch of photos of spidey to the of spidey to the daily bugle it's uh it's photos of the lizard versus spidey fight from the football field uh betty exposits that j jonah jameson is visiting his son who was in the hospital his space shuttle had to come in for an emergency landing and then we cut to the hospital dragon and we cut to jj and we see his son the astronaut with a traumatized look on his face like he is just staring into dead air he is just you know like he's just got this hollow look on his face he looks pale uh jj uh the the astronaut helmet is sitting on a chair by jj and we see a black gooey substance go over the glass Ah, of the helmet yeah so basically the idea is that the symbiote kind of got into john jameson and it messed with his head nice yeah yeah okay all right uh let's see so peter uh so basically ned's in the hospital he's in intensive care uh peter feels bad for michelle he doesn't want michelle to just go home and worry about that all night so he's like hey you know my aunt may and my great aunt you know they they're having dinner you know so of course we had a christmas dinner uh you want to come over tonight you know just to just to take your mind off things i'm sure they won't mind having you over so uh so they do and they have a you know and they have a nice a nice you know a nice christmas dinner (laughs) what can i say and then uh peter takes peter takes them to see ben's photos on the memorial and uh peter kind of tells a white lie to may about you know like yeah you know uncle ben uncle ben gave me these photos to restore them for him but i thought of a better cause i think i think it's great that he's a part of a bigger whole here and Aunt May, she is, uh, she's kind of taking it in. She's kind of looking at the photos of Ben, and then looking at the, and then looking at Peter. Of course, there's been a bunch of tension with Spider Man and everything. But uh, May, you know, she eventually kind of realizes she like she gives Peter a big hug, and then she whispers. She's like, she whispers in his ear. She's like, whatever you need to do as Spider Man, I have a feeling that Ben would be proud of you for taking responsibility with your gifts. So kind of like a nice sort of like, you know, way to say with great power comes great responsibility without actually saying it. <laughs> so essentially, uh, essentially the idea is Ben is the kind of person where he would put, you know, he would put others before himself every time when it came to the war and when it came to serving with his, you know, with his brothers in arms. And that's the same sort of uh, sort of mindset that she sees Peter taking and she can't help but be proud of him for that because that's modeling his life after the man that she loved, you know? So it's, uh, so basically we get kind of a nice sort of like, it's still a little bit uneasy, but you know, anyways, uh, 
So, sorry. So basically, uh, May has to has to drop off the great aunt at the airport, and so Peter offers to take Michelle to Rockefeller Center, and Michelle says he wants to check in on Ned soon, and she doesn't skate, but she'll go check it out. She don't, she's always wanted to see the tree in person. She's like, you know, she kind of makes a jab, like, isn't it funny how you can go, how you can live in New York your whole life and never have seen the Rockefeller tree in, in person? And Peter's like, it took me until I was 17 years old just to go to the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's kind of the joke I hear New Yorkers say about like, oh, you've been in this city your whole life and you've never even right. seen the Empire State Building, you know? <laughs> anyway. I'll have to change the age on that line because Peter's uh, 16. Oh, well, okay. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He could have. There's a chance he could have turned 17 between this and the between this and and the between homecoming and this. There's okay, let's change the line. He's like, well, I I didn't even go to see the the Statue of Liberty until I was 12. Right. Let's change the line. There we okay. go. Okay, and here is kind of our big reveal, Dragon. Of course, the the whole time Peter's been trying to think of what present to give Michelle, and he takes Michelle. And he swings her up to the top of the tree. And, of course, Michelle's just like, what? 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 Peter, what? You know, and Peter's like, yeah, I'm Spider-Man. I And I, wa I wanted you to, I, I wanted to tell you, Michelle, because me and Ned have both been lying to you. And then she's like, Ned knew? <laughs> yeah, don't be mad at Matt, Ned, okay? Oh, I'm mad at Ned. Well, he's in the hospital. And then and then Michelle is just like, she just gives an exasperated look like, oh, I want to be mad at that guy, but I can't be. <laughs> and so Peter's just like, you know, like, Michelle, this whole time I've been trying to figure out a present for you. And my present is this view. And they look up, you know, they're sitting on like the top of the Rockefeller Center tree, you know, like they're kind of like, you know, Peter kind of has them webbed up on kind of a hammock type thing. You know what I mean? on the top of the tree and uh, they're looking out over the view and whatnot. And Peter's like, and I also wanted to let you into my life just a little bit more. And yeah, that's, that's nice. That's nice. And we get no inclination of romance or anything. We're just, you know, good friends, good friends. Anyways. Okay. Um, oh God. Okay. Dragon. I, I'm very proud of this bit. I'm very proud of this bit. Okay. So we see J. Jonah Jameson back at the Bugle office. He's going through the stack of uh, photos that Peter Parker sent him. And one of them is Spider-Man with what is obviously a prop. It's basically like a sack with a dollar bill sign on it. <laughs> and it's like Spider-Man like at the school with, with like a, a bag of money, essentially. And it's obviously staged, right? But J. Jonah Jameson gets this look on his face like, Santa Claus is real. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that is that Peter like state like, yeah, what's he gonna do? It's just a prop, you know, it's not gonna prove anything. Let him have his fun sling, you know, let him let him have his fun, you know. <laughs> he is real. Santa Claus is real. <laughs> and he's taken up an unflattering photo of Spider-Man. All right. But, I, you know, I just love the whole idea of, you know, of course, J.K. Simmons delivering that type of performance. All right, wrapping up here, um, basically, we get three scenes. We get three scenes to wrap things up. Uh, at the hospital, we see Ned, and, of course, Ned, his face is not looking good. It's not, it's kind of like Two-Face, except it's like three-quarters face. Like, three-quarters of his face is messed up. Ugh. And, uh... And yes, this line is on the nose, Dragon. I know it is, but Michelle. Avenge me? No, no, no. Michelle's like, oh, wow, Ned, you look like a hobgoblin. Ah. <laughs> and then she also says, you know, she takes a pause. That's hot. <laughs> and of course, P uh, Peter feels very guilty for Ned's state. Ned's not really saying much. This is all kind of setting things up. You know, Ned had the accident. He's now deformed. You know, we're going to see what that brings yep. okay so uh oh god all right so then we see billy and mrs connors and they're visiting a deformed kurt connors in a hospital wing but it's behind glass for safety and kurt connors he's like half deformed right he's like 
like he's basically he's kind of got he's kind of mostly transformed back into the human but he's got like green scales over his skin and he just looks at his wife and he's horrified and he's just like why did you bring him here and then we just have a pan out from the prison why did you bring him here and of course, that's just a, a a tragic sort of play. Oh, and by the way, of course, J. Jonah Jameson getting the Spider-Man picture is his wrap up to his Scrooge arc. <laughs> so you know, but I don't know. I just really like the whole like, why did you bring him here? Because of course, the whole thing with Connors is he does not want his son to think of him as a monster. That was his whole motivation. Ah, I like that. It's a good ending for that lizard. Uh huh. Right. Like. Right. Okay. So we see May and Peter drinking some eggnog together, perhaps a little too much of it, because Peter is technically underage. Uh, May is just like, you know, she's a little schlocker, but she's like, I'm a terrible parental figure. <laughs> and Peter laughs it off a little bit. He's like, don't worry, Aunt May, I've had like one. It's fine. <laughs> and uh, and then Peter, uh, you know, Peter hugs Aunt May. They're staring at the fire and whatnot. And then we get a flashback of... Ben opening uh, Peter's stocking on Christmas and discovering a collection of vintage Captain America trading cards. Nice. And we pan out, uh, we fade out from the image of Captain America on the trading card to an image of Uncle Ben in the war on the photograph. And then the camera like pans out and we see like the mosaic and that's how it ends is, nice. this, is Uncle Ben on the mosaic. All right. Yeah. And that's it. And, of course, I'll have a couple of post credit scenes. But, all right, get into your act three. Okay. Uh, we start off uh, with uh, with Aaron Davis. Remember, that's the, uh, of course, the Prowler that we've, we've set up at the end of, uh, well, that, we, that we've set up in Inspiring Homecoming, you know, the future uh, Donald Glover's character. Uh, let's see. Basically, he's, he's uh, walking the streets of Hell's Kitchen in, in the, Around Christmas time, he uh, he meets with Turk Barrett. Uh, yes, he he's meeting with Turk Barrett. Of course, Turk Barrett being a big a character, a re recurring character in Daredevil and Luke Cage, and technically Jessica Jones. Well, it's not split hairs. Uh, the point is, uh, it's not a big character. Um, sorry, I tricked. Um, He's meeting with Turk Barrett, which is from the comics, the idea that uh, in the ultimate version of the Prowler, the Prowler uh, worked with Turk Barrett a lot, so I kind of found like, it's a perfect opportunity to kind of blend the Netflix with, uh, with with the MCU in a really great natural way. I mean, kind of hoping the movies will do this, so I kind of cemented a few like little seeds of that that here. And the idea is, again, I can't, I can't do a lot with Turk because I don't want to just, I have to be, I don't want to have to be reliant on the fact that people having seen the Netflix show. So I use Turk as a way of kind of rattling off a few interesting uh, I can't hear you, Tiki. Oh, my bad. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Did you like the Turk Barrett thing at all? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, Trike, and I didn't realize my mic was muted. Um, yeah, I love the Turk Barrett thing. That's a uh, that's a good kind of tie-in, especially to the Donald Glover character. I think those two would naturally, you know, that's kind of they're both in sort of the same world. Yeah, yeah, and again, it's kind of a neat thing from the comics, so it makes sense to kind of blend the MCU with the Netflix, and it's kind of the third act scene where kind of blend, act three essentially is blending Netflix with the MCU. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and he, also he'd be a way of, like, rattling off a few events from the Netflix shows without, uh, basically, that would be, if anyone hasn't seen them, it's like, oh, man, God, I gotta see what happened to know what Turk's talking about, man, that sounds cool. It's like a few, like, the, the awesome events that have happened, so... Uh, I will say this: So Turk went from guns, uh, running guns, to now he's a uh, he's a fence. You know, the guy like he he traffics stolen goods. So it's kind of what he's doing now. You know, a little less hazardous because he went from Daredevil to Luke Cage back to Daredevil season two, where he where he was almost hacked to pieces. Mm -hmm. So basically, he's expositing uh, to uh, to Davis here, to Aaron Davis. So again, it's kind of an Uncle Ben figure with Miles. So I kind of a little bit the Uncle thing kind of going throughout. Uh, he expo it's exposed that uh, Davis has been bringing him like a lot of stolen goods because again he's not he's not a reformed criminal he's still a criminal just he's not a violent one he uh, he's used those climbers he was so giddy about in Homecoming to basically you know, again he wears like pulls down a ski mask and he he climbs up buildings and he steals stuff that's kind of what he does climbers you know as as the Prowler and we have this great line from uh, Turk Bear saying when when he enters like if it isn't the Prowler himself <laughs> nice space. <laughs> the idea is steal some of Richie sells the Turk Barrett to make ends meet. So it's kind of the kind of interesting thing I thought to do with the, the Prowler. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Turk initially tries to give him like short change him in the deal, and you know, uh, uh, Aaron has this thing where he says, "Come on, man, my nephew's my nephew's over for the holidays. I want to give him a good Christmas." You know, Turk says, ah, "All right, because you're Santa's favorite." <laughs> You better get me something really nice. You better get me something really nice. Yeah, for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, anyway, so that, that's like a little bit just to check in, like, hey, we're also a little bit of nephew stuff going on, and of course, uh, Prowler. Hey, Prowler. And again, like, we're like, seating in Turk Bear. So then uh, on the sides, after that, CNN's very just in the same place, and like, uh, he walks out, then Marco enters. Well, if it isn't the famous Flint Marco, what can I do for you this holiday season? Mm hmm. He tells him that Gargan, and the idea is that uh, we know Gargan and Aaron Davis knew each other from Homecoming, so I would say, you know, because Aaron Davis, that, that's how uh, Scorpion has a lot of his connections, people who know people, so he knows Turk Barrett through that. And the idea is Scorpion and Turk Barrett have to go back a long way, so they're friends. So he, again, the message was, hey, get the turkey out, hey, get Turk Barrett. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, he, uh, he tells him that Gargan needs him. He needs needs a hitman. And he told him to come to come to Barrett for the Bug and Queens. Yeah, yeah, the Bug and Queens. <laughs> and uh, you, and he says you know how to find the best. So, and he'll cover it. You know, he'll he'll, he'll cover the costs. You know, who are we going to? Who, who, are we, who are we going to find the hitman? Because the idea again, like Turk would facilitate. Turk's a freelancer, so he goes from he works with everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we walk to, that we walk down the street to the next scene. We kind of build up, kind of our, our thing here. Uh, let's see. It's exposited on this walk to the next scene. Ever since Fisk got locked up, he controls the inside of the prisons. But uh, but out here, especially since uh, Daredevil has gone missing again, he's kind of retired right now. Between this and Defender, so and right, we ended right. Daredevil season two at Christmas time, so it all fits. Yeah, especially since especially since uh, Daredevil's gone missing, uh, gone missing. Hell's Kitchen is ripe for the picking. Again, a lot of people try to horn in on, uh, on the territory that Kingpin kind of freed up for everyone before he was print, before he was pinched. Mm-hmm. You know, people moving in on, on Fisk's territory. Uh, most recent, the biggest name doing it right now is this crime family, emphasis on family, this crime family from Yonkers. They uh, they put the first bid in. So basically, until anyone else kind of challenges them, they're right now they control, uh, they control Hell's Kitchen and like, a few of the other neighborhoods. Uh, he has a uh, and they have a freelancer for uh, for you and uh, for you and Scorpion, the guy you're looking for. Work uh, does a lot of contracts with them. So they go to this nice restaurant. It's kind of like in kind of the Hell's Kitchen of it all. It was a noodle place that was converted to a really nice Italian restaurant. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so uh, it's revealed that it's Silvermane. So Silvermane was. Like I know two- I should know that name, but I do you're, not. You're gonna laugh. love this. You're gonna love this. <laughs> okay. Well, I did not have a Captain America reference. I did have an Agent Carter reference in this. Oh, okay, nice, nice. So here's the thing: in the comics, just the way it goes, the Kingpin's constant competition is another mob boss by the name Silvermane. Silvermane, he's an older generation <laughs> mobster, and he has ties to the Magia, which again, Madame Mask from Agent Carter. She was. Uh, She's a, we had the Magia introduced in Agent Carter. Like they're like the, the gangsters of the 40s who traffic in high technology. Like they stole Stark weapons in the Tony Stark area. You know, these are the guys who traffic in technology and guns. And back in the 40s, they were you know, just mobsters. Mm-hmm. So the point is, uh, it's kind of like using a Kingpin figure because Kingpin's in prison. So this guy, logically, he would take over. And here's the cool thing I completely forgot about that. When I was doing my research, I was blown away by it. And I said, yes, I have to do this. Uh, this uh, Silvermane's real name, hence the silver, is uh, Silvio. Get ready for this. Oh God, Manfredi. Manfredi. Oh no. And here's oh, in the comics. No. In the comics, it went like this. In the comics, uh, Silvio was the father, and Joe Manfredi, the same character, Mm-mm. was the son. So what I did here is the idea that Silvio was like the grandfather. Joe was the uh, Joe Manfredi was the son, and let's say five or eight years after uh, we saw him in Agent Carter, he settled down. He had a kid. And that is uh, that is Silvio the second. Okay, I like it. I can buy it. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have Ken Marino play him. The same, same actor. actor. Okay, same actor, nice. but he's gonna be. He's older. <laughs> he has like either sh- uh, like silver streaks or he has like kind of silver hair entirely. He's older. He's got some old age makeup on him. So the idea, he's like in his uh, his uh, early to mid sixties. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. So again, it's a big old Agent Carter reference. I love this actor from Agent Carter. And I thought I'd give him something. He's a little bit more serious, a little bit older. Like he's not exactly as, as hilarious and awesome, but he's he, he's, he, he's like a, a, a terrifying mob boss now. So he's uh, he antagonizes Turk a little bit because you know Turk used to work exclusively for the Kingpin. Now he's a freelancer and it says 
says, ah, yes, Zerk Baird used to work for uh, the guy who stole stole this neighborhood from my family, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he says, like, hey, hey, I'm a freelancer looking for another. I go where the money is. You know that. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted the show, and this is Zerk Baird kind of being the smooth negotiator here. I just wanted to show respect to the new boss by asking uh, to use one of his favorites before I sought him out myself. That, and the fact, and basically this is what the Manfredi comes at him with, well, that, and the fact that I have him on speed dial, Turk has a big old smile on his face. <laughs> yes. So uh, the idea is Manfredi's amused by Turk Bear, so he, he amends this, okay, sure, fine, fine, I'll, I'll hook you up with, with, with one of my guys, uh, like the guy to go to for this. In the ho And it's in the holiday spirit. Well, in the holiday spirit, I'll cut you a break. I'll, I'll Give you the guy on speed though. I'll hook up the the, the arrangement, the deal, mm -hmm. for a for for a percentage of the take. Of course, of course, of course. He reveals that it is Lincoln. It is uh, L. Thompson Lincoln, and basically we, he gives him his uh, Lincoln be good for this job. Lincoln, who's Lincoln? Oh, you probably heard him by his street name. Again, we're building up this guy. He's like the big guy here, big third act villain, Tombstone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Doomstone, oh boy, oh boy, uh, and basically they expose that he's been the uh, he's been saying, uh, and Freddie's saying he's been spending a lot of time in Harlem since the bulletproof con got pinched. Mm -hmm. Like the idea is, this guy actually could probably fight Luke Cage. I love to see him in Luke Cage, to be honest, because he has ties in Harlem. Uh, Tombstone, Tombstone's a Spider-Man villain who's a, he's a he's a mob he's a mob hitman and enforcer. That's what Tombstone is. Okay. He, again, he's a freelance. He's worked for Silverman and Kingpin, so that's kind of why he worked him in here. Uh, I'll have him to you with him. I'll have them to you soon. Meantime, anyone hungry? You can offer him to make him some, some food on Christmas. Again, Manfred's a nice guy. <laughs> Pleasant you know? trees. Pleasant trees, yeah, Manfred. Exactly. That's what I'm going for here. Again, like some old Manfred love in that scene. He's allowed sure, this sure. father's in. He's the family oriented guy versus Kingpin is all power oriented. Mm -hmm. So, Spider Man swinging the rooftops. Uh, he's. Uh, He's feeling guilty over his fight with Aunt May. He's kind of airing this out to Karen. Karen's advice is uh, to patch things up, you know, from, uh, and kind of speak from the heart. Uh, before he can keep on talking about Karen about how to do that, they are interrupted by a mugging. There is a mugging going on. Basically, these three punk kids, these three punk teenagers, are mugging a charity Santa. Oh, God. Not charity Santa. Yes, charity Santa. They got a bell, a bell ringing Santa. They're, mm -hmm. they're mugging the guys like, you know, like, Give me that old man. They push him down. They they run off with the looting and spiraling. He's he's going there. He's about to chase all the thugs, but he sees like kind of Santa's having some trouble getting up, and he, he's kind of he does the responsible thing, makes the responsible choice, and uh, he helps the Santa get up, make sure he's okay, so he doesn't chase down the guys. So they kind of get away for the moment, let's say. And uh, here's a I'm proud of this. Tiki. This is a bit I'm, I'm convinced you're gonna love. I hope you're gonna like it. All right, all right, lay it on me. He. Uh, he Helps him up, and the reveal is it's the it's the it's the mall Santa. It's Stan Lee. Oh God! Okay, that's great. That's great. <laughs> and what's, what's funny here? So it's uh, it's Stan Lee, and he says, "Wait a minute!" So again, Byron recognizes him. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're the Macy Santa. Yeah. And then a moment of pause goes by. Oh, and you're that Spider guy. <laughs> God. Yeah, it's Spider it's, it's, it's Spider Man. Spider Man. Sure, sure, whatever. Well, what, why are you here too? I mean, you, you work. You're a charity Santa too. Yeah, you know it's a way to make ends meet around the holidays. He, and he sneezes. Importantly, he's, he's been out there for hours and he's kind of cold. You know, <laughs> you know it's. <laughs> and, but, oh but, God, no. poor Stan Lee. You don't want to give Stan Lee a common cold, man. That guy's hanging on by a thread. Well, gonna look. I actually gave Stan a role in this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he says, you know, he's doing it to make it. Oh, I'm just doing this to make men's meet around the holidays. He's a Santa who doesn't make a lot of money. Uh, yeah, like Homer Simpson. Yes. <laughs> he says, uh, well, you know, I do this to make ends meet around the holidays, but I also do it for the kids. <laughs> you know, it's all about being, and this is like a little phrase Stan Lee actually coined along the way. You know, it's all about being a purveyor of wonder to the kids. Mm -hmm. They says, but not you know he sneezes again, but not rotten teenagers again. The guys just mugged them like those three. <laughs> of course, not realizing that Spider Man's a teenager, just mm -hmm. saying something mm -hmm. like that, which is kind of, uh, which, which is kind of funny. Again, he, he sneezes out in the cold, and he's out with rotten teenagers. And uh, I've been out here for hours collecting for the children's hospital. Now, uh, it, now I guess I'm gonna be out here for a few more hours. <laughs> You know, he's going to sneeze and cough and all that stuff. Spider-Man tells him, again, a little moment of pause goes, Spider-Man gets an idea. You know what? 
Santa, why don't you, why don't you go inside there? He gives him like a few bucks. Hey, you go inside. You get yourself some hot cocoa. I'm going to be gonna be back here in like uh, I don't know, some undetermined amount of time because he's going to be back there later. So you, you get in there, you warm up. Uh, he grabs, he bars, he bars a Santa hat, his bell, and his bucket. I got an idea. We then have a musical montage. Okay, of, okay. Again, Karen's playing this on the suit. Uh, Santa Claus is coming to town. And it's a montage of Spider-Man collecting for the children's house. Yes, okay. Well, yeah, obviously, you and I kind of have... I, I mean, to be fair, mine's in Act 1 and yours is in Act 3, so it's it's slightly different. So it's a, it's a fun montage of Spider-Man uh-huh. going all around like these other loca- these locations we don't really see a lot with Spider-Man. He's, he's walking the streets in New York. Uh, he's a... Uh, he's, uh, Almost like a, almost like a street performer. He's like saying, "Hey, charity!" Or he's just swinging the bell, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, Spider Man! Yeah, let's give him charity!" <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, he's going. Uh, he's, he's going all over the place. We see him at the. You know, he's, he's collecting a lot of goodwill. You know, people are taking pictures with him. Hey, while well, you're taking a picture of me, why don't you donate to the children's hospital? And you know, they're doing it. It's, it's working wonders. He, he's walking through office buildings, collecting. He's like walking like in the elevators, going to office buildings. He's at the Chrysler building. He's, uh, he's at the. Su- he's. Uh, going to the subway, Grand Central Station. He goes to Greenwich Village, where we have a, there's a fun game where he knocks on Doctor Strange's door, and no one answers. <laughs> he, uh, he turns around, and I appreciate that. He turns around. There's a little Doctor Strange portal made, and then basically, so like a hand. It's either Wong or Doctor Strange. Uh-huh. Uh, like drops some money in the bucket. He turns around. Oh God, <laughs> that's great. That's great. And also, the last one I'm proud of this here, uh, again, for the Netflix of it all, uh, he goes by, uh, he does an on rate, he, on the radio, he does an interview with Trish Walker. Mm-hmm. And he basically says, yeah, I'm just raising money for uh, you know, for the holiday season, folks, you know, again, for uh, for the children's house. But he promotes the boat's thing, and you know, Trish is like, put some money in the bucket. Again, Trish Walker, uh, that's he. <laughs> uh, that's he, and, and Stan Lee, he's, uh... oh, and basically, while, again, we cut from like him talking on the radio uh, to a Stan Lee list overhearing the radio, saying, hey, Celsi, or all happy go lucky, like yeah, charity. Mm-hmm. Okay, Spiron's feeling good about himself. Uh, so now, basically, we cut because that's 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 taken care of. So now Spiron's just kind of swinging around. So, oh boy, you know, Karen, I feel good about myself. It really helps someone. But boy, would I love to deck the halls of those those rotten kids that stole from that 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 nice Santa. <laughs> uh, and uh, before, uh, let's see, there. Uh, Karen also has a police scanner built in there, so she kind of hears like uh, Peter is a Bolton going on about uh, about. Uh, robbery around the tenement buildings. So it goes around the tenement buildings again, kind of like in between. It's in Manhattan, so it's kind of like between Hell's Kitchen, which we know bad stuff's are coming. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's in the greater Manhattan area. So here's the basically Spider-Man is reporting to this like Bolton going on. And again, it is, uh, it's the Sandman baiting him. Okay. Basically, it's a, it's like there's a, someone's robbing the tenement buildings in a striped jacket. He knows the striped jacket from earlier on. It's the Sandman. That'll do. If that'll do, and then basically on the on the on the, in the sequence he has silver bells playing silver bells, silver bells. Da, mm-hmm. da, 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 da. So we have Marco versus Spider Man in the streets. Not a long fight, just you know he's a he uses like a manhole cover like to avoid some webbing, and he throws it in, into a cab. You Spider make sure the make sure the cabbie that make sure checks on the cabbie, checks on the cabbie, uh, make sure he's okay. She then web slings up to the fire escapes. So he's kind of following Marco on the fire escapes. He goes inside of an abandoned apartment, again, like kind of abandoned tenement buildings right now. And this is like the big, here's the tombstone entrance. So Marco escaped. No, Spiders like, again? He got away again, but then he realized there's a man in a black suit waiting for him. And it's a tombstone. Bum, bum, bum. So this is the first time Spider-Man's had to go up against an assassin or a hitman in any of the Spider-Man media things. Now, you see, when you brought up the hitman thing, I was like, oh, is he going to call the Punisher? <laughs> oh, Punisher's not a hitman. I, 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 then why was the Punisher going after Spider-Man in that one issue? Well, no, he thought he bought into the Daily Bugle saying Spider-Man's a criminal. He's a crook, and, the, and he basically said, I got I to gotta kill this bad guy. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Spider-Man, the Punisher doesn't take money for killing people. With TV. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Anyway, uh, so the, the, you, what Tombstone? Just to give you the, 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 the Tombstone's a tricky thing. And the reason we haven't seen Tombstone is because he has a tricky backstory because he's an albino African American. Ooh, oh man! But Ooh, that's that a cool is, thing. That is tricky. 
But seriously, that's, that's a cool thing with his backstory, though, because, again, I could definitely buy Tombstone and Luke Cage show because the idea is he was the one albino in Harlem who got mocked endlessly. He became a hitman and uh, an enforcer. Basically, you, you know, he terrified people, and you know, he was like the last thing they saw before they, they got killed. Like, uh, season two, please. Yes, that'd be great. That, that sounds, sounds really awesome. cool, right? <laughs> yeah. So the idea is I have to again. It's kind of hard to see how they pull off. I had a, I have a, I have an idea. Basically, whatever whatever gets the tombstone. My idea of getting around the whole again. Technically, it's kind of white face on black actors. Technically, so it's a tricky thing. Uh, what I what I'd recommend is uh, this gimmick with tombstone is that he he just looks like the actor, but if you uh, you know he wears makeup on top of the albinoism. He's really ashamed. It's like it's, he's really self conscious about it, so he covers himself up with you know it's black face on white face. It bounces itself out. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, regardless, like if you want, if you want to come, I think we can both agree there's no easy way to do that. Yeah, but if <laughs> the, here's the cool way I have around it, though, just in case, just in case, is that the explanation. If let's say we ever saw a Tombstone explore in F in like Luke Cage, the albinoism might be tracked to uh, IGH, the Jessica Jones uh, chemical company that kind of screws with people. Do they test on people? Right. Right. I'm saying okay. they got him as a baby. They tested on him, and that's why he looks the way he does, and that's that's the explanation around it. Be my guess. The point is, which is why he's really strong and he's really durable, and he again he's albino. And he also he uh, he he has like he filed his nails down, so like the really razor sharp nails he's got there. He's a really he's a really scary looking guy. If you ever look at him, Tiki, he's a really cool character. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking Michael J. White or uh, D. B. Woodside. But again, any really any really imposing, uh, really uh, cool actor. He has to be like a a, a really. A hint, like a, a hitman with a lot of history behind them. That's kind of the sense you want with this guy. Gotcha. Okay, so right off the bat, he knocks Spider-Man for a loop. Spider-Man doesn't see this guy coming. The guy practically blends into the room in shadow in that black suit. He always wears a black suit. That's Tombstone's uh, signature. Black suit, white face. But in this case, it's all black suit. So uh, he just he bashes Spider-Man right in the head across the room, and again, the music shut off. You know, it's because of that. So again, right now, this guy's a big deal. Uh -huh. Introductions. Uh, you know, we ask about the who are you? Tombstone. Really? Tombstone? That's your name? <laughs> and again, and here's, here's what I'm doing with Tombstone. Here's the reason I saved Tombstone. It's always been building the Tombstone here is because Tombstone... I've seen a reoccurring Guardians of the Galaxy gag. Oh, but seriously, I'm going... Here's what I'm going with Tombstone is that he's the first really kind of serious professional villain we've seen Spider-Man deal with in uh, on film, where he's a guy who, he's saying, hey, quip all you want. It's no joke. I'm going to kill you in this room. Right, I got you. Again, like again, we've seen Spider-Man pretty confident. Like no one's really been able to take down Spider-Man. Vulture was kind of close. We got to a really intimidating kind of like a guy who would believably kill Spider-Man without him having a chance against him. Uh -huh. But uh, so basically, Tombstone is kind of like rattling off a few details. Like I've done my research on you. You've been easily photographed. I watch you. You know, watch you on YouTube. I, I know exactly how you fight, kid. There's only one way this turns out: me killing you. you know, I, and the. Uh, the scorpion sent uh, the the scorpion sends his regards. He's basically saying the scorpion wanted me to tell you this is because of him. You know, it's like revenge for the scorpion. He pays a little like kind of like a last line to him. Almost. Right, right, sure, sure. Uh, okay, let's see. So initially, Spider-Man he, he's not really taking the guy seriously at first. He's a little thrown off, but again, he, he starts like shoots a web at him. Uh, you know, he webs up his arm, but Tombstone he grabs like a great opening move. He grabs the web that has been shot at his arm after it's been shot there. He pulls Spider-Man across the room, and he'll he you know he Pulls him close, bam, right in the face, right in the, he breaks one of the eyes, just when he punches him right there, one of the little electronic eyes. Aww. And he then, with the same web, he's starting to strangle Spider-Man with it, like, like piano wire. Ooh, ooh, God, okay. A pretty intimidating guy, right? Yeah, yeah. So again, then the, the battles of getting Spider-Man, he's never had to do this. He's really battling for survival right now. Right. Uh, let's see, uh, so, you know, a lot of action going on here, he, uh, after he tries to strangle him, uh, Basis, you made the wrong people. And that's when he drops the scorpion thing. The scorpion sends his regards. Uh, you know, uh, believe me, I've been pre I've been preparing to handle men much more dangerous than you, Spider Man. Yeah, again, Luke Cage. He's been preparing the fight with Luke Cage. Spider Man's like a pittance compared to Luke Cage in his in his eyes. Uh huh. Sure. Uh, you know, Spider Man dod is dodging a few again with a spider sense. He's dodging a few, but the gag is uh, the spider sense and like the one eye. It's like it's all red. So again, there's constant danger. So it's not really helping him that much. He's going with the I instincts. Like that. Versus I like that. So again, it's like he's dodging a few blows, but he's still getting hit a, a couple times. Uh, again, it's like the most dangerous one of the most dangerous guys Spider Man's really had to face in this early Spider Man career right now. It's like pre Venom. This is like the most dangerous guy's face so far. Um, 
uh, let, let's see. So you know, he does, he leaps uh, leaps a few leaps over him a, a time or two. He uh, like he leaps to the ceiling. He's wall crawling on the ceiling. Tombstone grabs him and throws him down on the ground. Like he Spider Man's not getting away from this guy. Uh, let's see. He um, t- um. Oh yeah, like if, if he webs him up, he basically slices out of it with the with you know his razor sharp nails. He's slicing out of the webbing again, like he's on un- seemingly he's unstoppable. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, all right, right. Oh, yeah, Spider-Man does get a few hits. He gets a few hits in his face. Like he's punching him in the face, and there we reveal like kind of the white underneath the underneath the the the. Ooh, right, right. So, Ooh, and basically, like almost Joker ass. That's creepy. That's what I'm saying. So I he's like punching, it. like what the? And he's saying, uh-huh. "That's personal." Because again, he's really sensitive about it. that's personal. It's a scare tactic I use sometimes, but it's very, very personal. Basically, kind of like a face of death sort of thing. This is the last thing people see when I really when I get really pissed off mm-hmm. and want them dead mm-hmm. fast. And uh, you know, but you'll get to see it in your last moments. I'll make sure of that if you're really interested in seeing it. So let's see. Then you know, he's uh, Spider-Man's using all these different web combinations, like kind of uh, you know, with, with Karen. It's not, it's not working. It's not helping. Uh, you know, he's, he's like you know, trying to bolo webs here, all sorts of different web things. But again, it's just it's like it stuns him a couple times. So that's about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. He. Uh, All right, so then the, basically the thing, if the eye wasn't busted from the first hit, then this is like the one that busted. Basically, he like you know, takes a really bad shot to the head, and that busts the busts the eye, and basically uh, he has like Spider-Man gets a concussion with this hit, and basically he's muttering to himself because he's again yeah, with the concussion in the middle of battle. He's kind of muttering, Karen, he's about to like ask Karen for like help or something, but he's like, Karen, white Christmas. Oh God! Oh God! Okay. He's really, again, he has like a serious concussion going on here, and he's just then basically Karen's playing a really warped, eerie version of White Christmas. Oh man! I'm dreaming of basically then now the fight's getting really deadly as this music is playing. Of a white Christmas, it's like a this. warped version of the built of the uh, Bing Crosby version. Yeah! Yeah. Okay, nice. Of the Bing Crosby version, while like snow, he sees snow falling outside. He's thinking of Uncle Ben, so he has White Christmas on his mind. He says White Christmas. Then all this is going on, so uh, again, it's all warped and distorted. He has like a um, final look. All right, so basically, you know, he's giving uh, Spider-Man all these like these. He's getting ready for like he lifts Spider-Man up. He's about to like, kind of strike him a few more times before like the killing blow. And he says, "Kid, it's pointless. You can stop fighting. I studied you." You put up a good fight, but you know. But uh, he says, you put up a good fight, but you don't know how to use your power. Power being the operative word. You don't know how to use your power. He uh, he tosses him, and he, you know, he tosses him, he hits him like across the room for a second there, and uh, he then is holding uh, Spider-Man, essentially by his non-existent lapels, holding him up. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man, he's in, a, he's in a daze, and while he's in a daze, he's having these, these flashes He's having these cryptic flashes, kind of like the best way I can describe it. It's like that scene in Age of Ultron when you uh, we, we see what the Scarlet Witch has done to the Avengers' minds, where like you know Captain America's dancing with uh, uh, Peggy Carter in silence. You know, like we mm-hmm. just cut to like it's cryptic stuff that you can't hear, but you're seeing it. It's just, like really cryptic. That's the way. It, that's the way it's executed here. So it's like like all like your life flashing before your eyes type stuff. So uh, a few a few eerie cryptic flashes of, of uh, Christmas with Uncle Ben when he was alive. And again, we're seeing the Hank Azaria Uncle Ben, like a young young kid opening up gifts. Uh, they're watching White Christmas. Uh, he's they're unwrapping the gifts that Aunt May has wrapped. Uh, and of course, as things are really amping up to the end here, and he sees uh, he he sees uh, May alone at uh, at Ben's funeral. Oh. And then like the last. Uh, the last thing here. So again, actually, he says this line. Then he has the power line. I just said. So you know, he says. You, we hear Hank Azaria saying. We don't see him say. So we hear him say, "Peter." Then uh, we we, we uh, then Tombstone says the thing about you know, kid, you don't know how you use your power. And then we have like the POV of of, of the Spider Man. Basically, we don't see the burglar, but it's like that shot where he's holding the burglar up from the Raimi movies. Remember when he's like holding up to the holding up? Oh to yeah. The oh yeah. We basically see like the burglar's perspective on Spider-Man in that shot, you know, kind of like how, uh, how Tombstone is holding him right now. He's like holding him like he was the burglar. And, uh, Spider-Man has this line as if he were saying it at that moment, he, he can sing, no, as he would like, no, Oh my God, it's the burglar. He's, he's saying no. As we cut from that to this, I know it comes with great power. 
again, like, that's the closest we get to saying with great power comes great response. Yeah, I kind of, like I said, I kind of had like that cheat line as well. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I really like what I'm doing do with this here. So, no, I know it comes from great power. Yeah, for sure, for sure. We see like a, again, like another like kind of cryptic flash of just May and Peter at Ben's funeral. Mm. It's something that I'll never forget. Oh man, okay, I'm liking I, it. He I'm liking his it, man. You're, you're, you're really driving up the pathos here. He's clenching his fist. He's freeing himself from the you know, tombstones group. He's getting a few shots in, and uh, he's now he's like morally thrashing him too, as he's actually thrashing him a little bit here. Uh, you know, he's basically saying, "You, what do you do with your power?" To hurt people, their families, for money. For what? For money? You're the reason they don't have people around for the holidays. I love how emotional you're getting over this, Dragon. This is a great reading. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just, you know, say like, you know, this, is, this is the reason people don't have other people around the holidays, because of people like you. Uh -huh. And he, and now he's holding him like the burglar. Again, near a window, too. He's holding like the burglar near the window. And then Toom says the best line here where he says, again, now there's a lot, a lot more like smears of white on his face. And he's saying, hey, kid, it's just business. Like, it's just business, kid. Again, he's not taking this person. He's going to kill this kid because he was paid to kill this kid. Right, right. Spider-Man's angry, tosses him out the window. And he catches him with the web on the way down. He's like, hangs him like by a street lamp or something, like a lamp or a post. Uh, let's see. So then, uh, he then he jumps from the window down there, and uh, you know, Tombstone he's, he's helpless. He's like he's dangling. He's, he's all webbed up, and like he, the hands are away, so he cannot free himself. Spider Man like punches him a time or two, and he walks away. He kind of grabs like a like a snowball, hits him directly in the face with a snowball. And what he does with this, like now all the all the makeup's gone. Now it's just it's all white. How's it feel being powerless now? Then as he's walking away, Tombstone gives him, again, a bit of, like, wisdom here. He gives him a bit of, a hey, kid, you know, almost like a little bit of respect. He says, watch yourself. Then, uh, like, a little little button on the scene. Just as Spider-Man's walking away, he kind of notices the kind of mark, like, by a bus stop or something. And he kind of timer webs him to a bus stop. Oh. Uh -huh. Say, hey, you got the sand now. Like, Sam's like, ah, darn it. <laughs> okay. Big emotional scene. May and Peter. Okay. So, we just saw Spider-Man's been through a lot, right? I don't mean to rush you, but you're close to the end, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. cool, cool. Okay, May, May and Peter. Here's a, here's a scene here. So, uh, she's been uh, she she's worried over uh, she's been worrying over Peter. Peter beaten. You know, he he instantly tries. Yeah, to Yeah, you've had a good arc set up with that for sure. So Peter enters. Obviously, he's beaten. He's really beaten at this point. And before May starts the panic, he just tries to quail her, saying, "Shh, I I, I know, I know." You know, he's just he's telling her to amp down. Essentially, easy, easy, easy. He explains that you know, look, I, I know, I, I look a mess, but you gotta understand. I basically explain that he does this for Ben. You know, the last time I didn't help, he got killed. So you're kind of going like that's sort of the same idea I was going for, right? Like a little, yeah. Like May sort of realizing that it's what Ben would want him to do. Yes. Okay. Not with the military okay. background, but yes. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. You know, I I wanted to be there for him. Uh, um, I wanted to be there for him and and for you, but it it's again it's like the fifth it's like the sixteen year old kid breaking down here. Again, he's just the kid, and he's doing all this great heroic stuff. But he's just the kid. He's saying, I, I want to be, I wanted to be there. I want to be there for him like this, and I want to be there for you. But it's just it's so hard. Mm -hmm. And Peter says, "Look, I will always." Uh, she says to Peter, "Peter, I will always worry about you because I love you." I know he's proud of you, like I am, but he'd be worried too, like I am. But I, but you promised me right here. You promised me, like you promised him. Uh, honestly, you promised him to be here, be here with me. You be here, like don't get killed. Essentially, don't get killed. Mm -hmm. Be be here for me because I can't lose you. So, Dragon, what you're trying to say is the world may need their Spider-Man. <laughs> But I need my Peter Parker. Essentially, yes. yes. <laughs> Pulled a little bit from the Flash because it was on my mind. Yes, of course, yes. of course. And then, of course, like, uh, Peter has this line: "You'll never lose me. Hey, oh. You'll never lose me." Uh, and then, you know, again, now they're kind of consoling each other, and she has, she has this kind of sad, beautiful line where she says, "Ben was the glue that held us together." Oh, I, I, I've been worried. Oh. I've yeah. been worried. I'm not enough. Then, then Peter says, uh, Peter like goes hit behind her, like like basically hit it somewhere like, under a floorboard. Or something. He 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 gets the gift that he that he got from May. Mm -hmm. 
And he says, he's still the glue. She opens up the gift, and it's a snow globe with a picture inside of it of the three of them uh, at Christmas time. And he added a little modification to it. So basically, because again, this is the stuff he got at Radio Shack with the snow globe. Right, right. He, it projects the image like onto a wall, and it plays White Christmas. Oh, you got it. You got it. You they hug, fly dog you. Let's see. They hug each <laughs> other. And uh, beyond that, I have uh, just like kind of the, the, like in like minute for, for this now. I'll be done for those. Okay. Sure, sure. That, let's see. Okay. We, cut, we go to the prison and we reveal that Marco and, and Gargan now are on the same page. And, yeah, I still owe you. And I want, I want them to. Believe me, I do. And like he says, now Marco's working on an escape plan for them to get out of prison. And per the comics, and I'm really proud of this. Uh, Electro enters. Elect again. Electro is now put in the prison, and in the comics, the Sinister Six. I'm not saying they're forming the Sinister Six entirely, but I will say this: in the comics, the Sinister Six were broken out because Electro caused the power failure. Okay, that makes sense. So Electro enters, and then Marco gets an idea. One could say, an "Awful idea." Yes, he <laughs> says, "That's our way out." Spider-Man finds the three. Meanwhile, Spider-Man finds the three teens. Who stole from Santa Claus is they're on his naughty list. A little bit of a dead thing, as I know. <laughs> right, right. And uh, lastly, here's the last. Here's the last bit. You're gonna love this. You're gonna love this. Okay, okay. Hit me with it. We have Santa Stan in his apartment. Oh God. <laughs> uh, he finds uh, he finds a red bucket with a note on it. The note says, "I took care of all the I took care of the children's hospital. You hold on to this." Call it a Christmas bonus. Merry Christmas, Spider-Man. Stanley Claus goes, aw. And he says, like, just, again, it's the last couple minutes, like, we don't care. It's just the sort of moment if he just says, almost lay out the window to New York, or, or to himself, whichever just sounds better. He says, Merry Christmas, Spider-Man. <laughs> I love it. Hence I love the it. title. Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay, what's your mid-credit? Okay, so my big credit is basically we see a fully put together news report from Betty Brandt, who is defending Spider-Man's name from the slanderous photo that J. Jonah Jameson is using. Like, come to find out, the sack that was missing was actually just a sack that was used for dodgeballs at the gym. And Peter, and uh, I'm sorry, not Peter Parker, but Spider-Man must have painted the dollar sign on himself. At any rate, there was... There was no money to be found. Uh, basically, what happened is that they found the uh, uh, they found the sack. You know, they found the sack, the dollar sack, but it was empty, and uh, you know, so it, it, like Betty Brant's like trying to clear Spider Man's name. It's pretty obvious that it's a joke, you know. But then we cut to we cut to J. Jonah Jameson face to face with Betty Brant, and she looks scared. You know, she's like, "Do you like it, sir?" And then J. Jonah Jameson looks pissed, you know, because he's essentially undermined, right? And he's got, like, that eyebrow thing going, and he's just about to... He lifts one finger, he opens his mouth, and then we cut back to credits. Okay. So basically, it's like, you know, it's like J. Jonah Jameson's ultimate, like, I believe in Santa Claus gift <laughs> kind of turned on its head. Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, and then the post credit scene, Dragon, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Oh, I am really proud of this one, okay? It's, it's Captain America yeah. as a mall Santa. So, yeah. he's got, so he's got the beard. Oh, my God. Uh, which I think is clever, of course, because in Infinity War, he has a yeah, beard, I, and now he I has a Santa it. beard. Yeah. I'm loving it. And he's got the bell, and he's like, you know, kids, if you want to donate to a charity, I've got a charity for you. Toys for Tots. My gosh, all the good little boys and girls who are unfortunate this time of year could really use your help. So be a hero for Toys for Tots. Then he points at the camera, gives a little wink, and then, Dragon, we get a link to the Toys for Tots website at the end. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think that's a nice, like, kind of, like, the post-credits literally is basically Captain America doing a charity plug. Complete nice. with like the link to the charity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that's it. Okay, okay, my mid credits, and the minute I do the voice, you're gonna know exactly who it is. But this is built as a reveal at the end. Okay. Uh, so the Tinkerer, who again, hey, it's the Tinkerer. You know, want to set up with the Tinkerer for like the next movies. You know, like yeah, he's building weapons for villains and stuff. All right. 
So the tinker is has been coerced to visit a man in prison. It was obscure until the very ending of the scene. And, uh, you know, uh, Mason's welcome there. He says, you know, he was, uh, he was, I felt compelled to be here. Again, you know, he's strong armed in the showing up to make sure that he got the invitation. Like, he's not being threatened. He's like, hey, make sure you show up. Uh, what's this about? I've read up on your exploits. Oh, God. <laughs> I've seen your handiwork with the vulture. Very impressive. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's just your your fisk impression is so distinct. Go ahead. Is it not good? Is it no, it's good. It's, it, I, I'm just saying it's very distinct. It's yeah. like, oh, that takes me right back to the Daredevil season two days. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. See, I guess, uh, basically, so you know, it's, uh, I'm very basically he's very impressed by you know the fact what well, it did for the vulture and he word gets around. The idea is the kingpin hears everything, and wants to keep it that way. It's kind of the crux of the scene. Basically, saying. I'm sure people will be looking to hire you. I, you see, Mr. Mason, I care about New York. And I care about its future, even from here. I've come to learn that New York is becoming an increasingly complicated place. And times are changing. I know New York. I need New York. I know I need. You need New York. All right. <laughs> and I think I require a smarter approach. So I'm offering you an arrangement with two stipulations. That is for that's for you to agree or leave on the table. You to agree, basically, he's like, making sure like he's not threatening, but again, this could work to his benefit. But he's got other plans in the works, so again, be helpful. But if not, um, all right. You see, I wish to. Fund your, I, I wish to fund your work. And he wants to fund him making all the suits. He wants to own everything. I only wish to know what your project is and its application. Mason saying, so you want to know who and what? Correct. And like any good investor, I require final say. You know, a little bit of homage to the, the Marvel Sony deal. Mm -hmm. A fail safe to anything you build for anyone you build it for. So what I'm doing here is a uh, this is like the classic thing we can finally get from Spider-Man, where the kingpin is like manufacturing all these villains. He's the fun, he's funding the villains. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And he has like if any of the villains cross him, he can shut them down, knowing the specs of their suits and stuff. So and he like he'll know if Silvermane's up to something, he can like make sure like he'll, his jobs fail. He can make sure like you know, kingpin has all the power. It's awesome. Do we have a deal? Yes. Happy holiday, Mr. Mason. <laughs> that's my post credit. I mean, that's my mid credit. My mid credit. credit. Mid credit. Yeah. My post credit's very short. Post credit's just a gag. It's uh. Okay. You see, we, we, we cut to we're at, the, we're at the upstate facility. Happy Hogan is walking in an Iron Man suit. <laughs> He's in an Iron Man suit and he's in, yeah, it's basically, we don't even see the, we don't even see the inside, just like, basically, like, someone in an Iron Man suit. Like, yeah, we hear John Favreau saying, oh, man, this is cool. This is, and Tony's off to the side saying, happy now. Yeah, this is, this is, this is great. Oh, how do I do this? And basically, what he does is he accidentally cues a repulsor blast that takes oh, like, a big ball on the wall and propels him out of the scene. And then we just oh, man. <laughs> And That's Tony just like thing. face palms and like kind of puts his hand to his face like oh, oh. Yeah, like 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 it gets a headache or something. Like, this is why we can't have nice things. It's Malibu all over again. <laughs> and that's oh, the end. I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. Final thoughts, Dragon. All right. So Dragon, I I, I did really like yours a lot. I will admit though, I think you maybe had like maybe two or three too many villains. Um, I appreciate what you were trying to do with all the villains and how they are kind of working off of each other and everything. To me, it's just like the villain sort of almost took away from the Christmas the Christmassy elements of the story. Uh, I, however, I will say that once you got to uh, the last one, the I'm sorry, I'm, you know I'm shit. Tombstone. Shitting. Tombstone, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tombstone was really well done. He was really well realized. Uh, you know, I got to just kind of like... I, I think maybe you should have probably picked one of Flint Marco or the Rhino. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily think you had to have both of them. Uh, having said that, the, like I said, the villain thing is kind of my main sort of nitpick with it. But I thought yours was really good. It accomplished a couple uh, very successful things, Dragon. I think you 
you were really looking to tie this into the Netflix universe. And that makes sense, of course, because Spider-Man's a street level hero. And I think you did that very well. You, you know, it was kind of a nice sort of tapestry to weave us into that sort of general direction. Um, I think your humor is on point. And I love what you've done with Stan Lee. Uh, like I said, I, I would have liked to see a little bit more Christmas stuff in there and a little less of the like villain action stuff. But uh, for what it is, Dragon, it was, it was really good, really well thought out. Like I said, uh, very, very good heartwarming stuff with Stan Lee. Uh, awesome. I, I, love the, I love the Happy Hogan thing with the suit. That's great. Uh, maybe kind of wish you would have used Ned and Michelle a little bit more. Instead, of, again, like I said, it just your villains were cool. I just kind of felt like they were too much at the forefront. That's my only issue. You know what's funny? You know how many villains I actually used? Oh God! If oh, you uh, if you count Turk Barrett, if you count Turk, oh God, Barrett, it's ten. <laughs> it's ten. You see, that's what to, I'm talking about. To okay. be fair, though, I mean, look, to be I'm saying it here. I got let's see. I got uh, I got Electro, I got Rhino, I got uh, Sandman, I got uh, of course Kingpin, I got Silvermane. That's five. Um, I, so I, you you do see the issue here, right? I hope you see the issue. I, look, I see the issue, and I contemplated <laughs> taking the silver main stuff out, but you know, I, I found an opportunity because I was going to use Sandman. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, again, because I love in Spectacular Spider-Man, Sandman, Rhino, they really work well. Again, that'd be a way of kind of getting like an additional guy in there. I'm just basically part of like, a, yeah, I just found like a lot of opportunities with the Rhino, so I kind of worked him in there. And I found like again, we're kind of we're kind of doing some villains over again, but kind of making it a little bit more natural and kind of different. So. Sure, sure. I was, I was kind of theory number thing. Maybe actually no, it's probably not ten. It's probably like nine or something. But again, oh. it, is a, it, is a, it is a number of them. Okay. All right. Uh, so Dragon, let me ask you: Did my special make up for the dumpster pile that was the thirteen reasons, the thirteen days of Christmas? It is far superior to that. And I was saying it's balanced. Yeah, it doesn't put you above it. It bounces you out. All right. Fair enough. I think I'll it take might it. be. I'll it, take is, it. it is one of your best pictures. I'll give you that. It's like in the top three. Yeah, I'm really liking it. I'm really liking what I came up with. <laughs> I, uh, the only thing that's kind of like, again, it's something that I wouldn't do. I'm not saying you have like, a reservation about the rainy stuff. Well, I mean th that, but more so I have a reservation about, it. And again, I don't think it was bad. It's just, again, something I wouldn't do. Cause again, I like to make my kind of fit within the movies as much, like fit within the story as much as possible. I, uh, I think Ned's, uh, you know, Ned become the hobgum. It, it was cool. I like kind of the idea of that, but again, I think it's like for, for Christmas special, it's maybe a step too far. Like, you know, we're laying too much pipe with that. I, you know, and it's funny you mentioned that, Dragon, because I feel like that's a reoccurring thing with uh, my pitches versus your pitches, that my pitches do tend to have a lot of this, like, story stuff. Because basically, like, like I like how the CW-verse does their Christmas specials, where it's like something really dramatic happens over Christmas. So that's kind of the way I was sort of seeing it. And, Dragon, I've got to admit, I've not done any bit of, any bit of research into the... Uh, Ned version of Hobgoblin, so I, I really don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if he even is disfigured or if he Here's just the goes one around cool and wears thing. a mask. Okay. Here's the one cool thing, though, is that you, you could have done, is that uh, the Ned leads, again, the, we, we haven't, again, the, the Spider-Man's tricky with last names nowadays. So, uh, you know, they always reveal, like, what the last name is, because they're not quite sure yet. Uh, Ned, if he's Ned Leeds, you know, L-E-E-D, uh -huh. it's Ned Leeds, they could, uh, I, believe, I want to say that version has a relationship with Betty Brown. One of the ne one of the Neds, like there's Ned Lee, there's Ned Leeds, and then like a lot of people are saying this version of Ned is like based on an ultimate version called Ganky, Ned Ganky. Uh huh. Right. Right. Ned Gank. But uh, the the point is just that uh, one of them has a relationship with Betty Brant, which you maybe could have like kind of done with the Betty Brant character. I don't know. Okay. Okay. That's not right out there. Is you know something again something to do maybe. Uh -huh. But I mean, on the whole, though, I, I, I loved your lizard stuff. I really thought your lizard stuff was was good. That was kind of my favorite part. I love the the ending was fantastic with the lizard. That's him. Jazz the belly. Why yeah. did you bring him here? That was great. I'm, I'm, that's <laughs> what I'm so proud of you for. That's the one I'm like. Aww. I think it's the most proud I've been with you. In one of these pitches, like, oh, that's really good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's uh, one of like again. Yeah, you have some of the better call Saul stuffs up there too. So. Uh -huh. uh -huh. there, you know, so um, and they'd say like that again. The use of J. Joan Jameson was good. Like, whole, like you know, there is a Santa Claus. You know, that was. Uh, that was <laughs> I was cool. really proud of that when I came up with it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not opposed to introducing. It's kind of like the it's kind of like the Stewie Griffin plutonium thing. You know, it's like he is real. He's really real. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not thrilled with all your Aunt May stuff. Mainly the whole like the the grand like, the great aunt thing. You know, well, not the you know her uh, you know, her mother mm -hmm. working that. I wasn't crazy about. 
wasn't crazy about uh, that, but at the same time, I uh, you like what I was going for with the Aunt May kind of like coming to terms with Spider Man thing. Well, yeah, sure, because yeah, I also kind of had something like that. So right, I, what, right. what did you think of mine? What did you think of like my all my Peter May stuff? What you, they kind of put some oh, effort, I think uh, your Peter May stuff was far superior to mine. I'll tell you that right though. Uh, because I mean, like I, I said, I didn't really have a lot for me to do besides just kind of be on the sidelines and like, hey, Rosemary Harris, yay. Like, for example, the Vietnam thing is not something I would have I would have figured on. I'm not against it. I just I, I never in a years would have figured on. I love how you worked in Captain America. I, I think timeline wise, it makes sense that it does. Yeah, it, you know, it makes sense because that's you know assuming he'd be your your uncle Ben would be probably close to his sixties. Uh huh. Right. But, right. Uh, anyway. I don't know with the let's see. Um, and yes, I am very proud of that final shot where you know the Captain America trading cards exactly that, into the Ben photos. I'm I'm very proud of that. That's what I'm saying. That's the other thing. Like, well, I'm not. Well, yeah, I wouldn't come up with the Vietnam thing. I love that ending based on it. You know, like like where you went with it. It kind of likens Uncle Ben to sort of like a Captain America type figure. Which takes and, me back to this wonderful scene in the comics where uh, Spider Man and uh, and uh, that, you know the older version of Uncle Ben, basically Spider Man and. Uh, and Captain America eating hot dogs on a roof together. And uh -huh. uh, he basically talks about his Uncle Ben. And he like, uh, Uncle Ben said World War II is the last great war. And then, of course, Kevin's the last, I don't think any of them were a great war. <laughs> right. But, right. Uh, but yeah, it was like, uh, it kind of takes it back to kind of like, uh, like the idea is uh, Captain America has like some respect for Uncle Ben. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yes, just you have yeah, a lot of good stuff. Just again, structurally, I mean, there's some choices I wouldn't make for the, the grander whole of where the movies might be going. But dang out, the Raimi uh -huh, stuff, I I just, if I were you, I just would have kept uh, the Tobey Maguire thing, would have kept, um, kept McGuire, would have kept uh, J.K. Simmons, and would have kept Dylan Baker. I think the rest of them might have been overkill. You, you, I, I like Franco. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Frank. I mean, I get, I could you love Frank. the line with Aunt May competing in the pie eating contest, okay? You you ate that shit up, literally. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. I will admit, if I were to cut any of the Spider Man things out, I would definitely cut Rosemary Harris. Um, Alfred Molina, like I said, it just comes down to casting. Like I wasn't, you know, like sure the whole uh, the whole Aunt May Doctor Octopus thing did come to mind, but. At the end of the day, it really is, I really do think that Molina will crush it as Uncle Ben and give us give us kind of like a more ethnically kind of diverse Uncle Ben that than we're used to seeing. You know, like I said, kind of like the second generation American style Uncle Ben. Oh, and sure, it's just like the whole familiar face of it all is a thing that kind of puts me up. Not the act, of course. I mean, I know well, like I said, you, you you'd use makeup and stuff. Like you'd make sure he looks as little like Doctor Octopus as possible. All right. All right. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of proud of my take on Electro, too. Kind of like those. You pressure. did do a good Electro. Yes. I like the back and forth banter that Spidey has with him. All right. Now, what'd you think of Happy Hogan? Because I was thinking about cutting that out. I love Happy Hogan. I, I'm glad you didn't cut him out. Uh, I was dying from that post credit scene. I was dying. <laughs> but I, I tell you, though, that, that Stan Lee thing, it was kind of it dawned on me. Like, because you know, I was thinking of where, where to put Stan Lee's sand and I realized, wait a minute. What if it was both? And what if we had kind of like, uh, you know, Stan just having, like, what if we made like the most, again, kind of another like uncle figure in the line of these uncle figures, kind of being like just a nice guy that Spider wants to help out. And in ways, he's kind of getting his Christmas spirit back. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. Okay. All right. Okay, so, so I fun. guess let's, yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, let's unwrap what is coming up on the season finale, folks. On the season finale, we are talking about a very, very important and powerful episode of All in the Family. Of course, we already did uh, Edith's Breast Cancer Scare as a season finale for season two of Christmas in July. This time, we're looking at another Edith-centric episode, Edith's Crisis of Faith. And man, oh man, Dragon. It's a two-parter. It's got some good Archie Bunker comedy. It's got some cool products. But it's a heavy episode in all the best kind of ways, and I can't wait to break it down. All right, so tropes. All right, uh, let's, we're just going to go back and forth and kind of listen to tropes that we got from ours, I guess. Uh, so yeah, definitely Stan Lee Claus, you know, Santa Clauses. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, putting the mistletoe underneath the microscope. I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, okay, I got, I got snow and I got white Christmas. Uh-huh. Uh, like I said, like the science, you know, the science kind of dissecting, like we got wrapping paper, we got eggnog, we got Santa hats, that kind of stuff in Connor's science experiment. I got a boatload, I got a boatload of Christmas songs. And again, I love the advent of Karen because I can do stuff like that. I was really proud of that. Like kind of Karen, play, like how to score, score of things practically. Mm -hmm. 
uh, let's see, I have uh, some, I have kind of like the competition to get the girl the present. Right. I got the, uh, the, the, the Christmas shopping montage. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got kind of like the charity Santa, like Spidey kind of going around delivering presents. I also have the charity thing with Spider-Man. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I, uh, let, let, let's see. Uh, I got Rockefeller Center. Uh-huh. As do I. <laughs> yep, yeah. <laughs> yes, I uh, let's see. I use uh, Christmas lights as weapons. Uh, uh, okay, I, I did not do that. So please. <laughs> um, J. Jonah Jameson is my Scrooge. Sure, sure. I don't really, I don't think I, I don't think I have a Scrooge. Yeah, you don't need a Scrooge and everything. Yeah, sure. All right, uh, let's uh, see. Kirk Connors is, you know, Kirk Connors has the whole uh, I'll be home for Christmas plot line going. Sure. I guess, in a uh, very tragic way. I got kind of the, uh, the Christmas without a loved one, of course. Got Christmas oh, yeah, one. big time, big time. And it's fair to say that permeates in both of ours. Certainly, certainly. I got, uh, you know, a lot of references to the North. Uh, Christmas jail visit for me. As do I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like bingo. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, right, right. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, we already had visitor in the prison visitor in the holidays. All right. Um, uh, a gift, you know, uh, someone uh, trouble around the having trouble around the holidays. You know, with the Peter May stuff, he's kind of having some sure, you know, sure. issues around the holidays. Mm -hmm. And the emotional kind of resolution to those issues you know, at the very end, kind of emotional kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Fruitcake as a weapon. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was great. That was great. Uh, uh, Toby Maguire is my mall Santa. Nice. <laughs> uh, how about the, the barrage of people in Santa suits trying to rob the mall, much in the style of Santa mask? Yes, 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 and I love that because that basically, if I, in hindsight, I, w I might have tried to rip off that idea had I known because I just realized, yeah, my cartel guys just kind of guys in mask and really, they right, would have, right. it would have been a little much though. That's probably that's that's, that's probably why. Uh, just a Christmas revenge. Sure, sure. We yeah, can, I'm seeing we can it. Do yeah, that. Christmas revenge. I mean, reverse flash and Christmas revenge. Exactly, exactly. You know? Merry Christmas, Flash. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mister Mason. Um, let's see. I'm kind of, I'm, I think I'm pretty much getting towards uh, the Seasonal end. colors, green and red, because the opening with Electro, you know, green sure. and red. Uh, Captain America at the end of mine, giving a legit charity message. <laughs> uh, Grinch references, again, with Electro, a lot of Grinch oh, yeah. references. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, how about for me, uh, kind of the idea of giving someone a non, a gift that's not an object, yeah, yeah, sure. And I also had the kind of the little the thoughtful gift, you know, the kind of the handmade yeah. gift with the snow globe. And I also had kind of like the gift that keeps on giving reference. Mm, sure, oh, and sure. a lot of Iron Man 3 Christmas references. <laughs> yeah. I had a couple in there. I had a couple of those. Okay. And the Christmas bonus. Okay, I think that's it. All right. So, folks, much like Spider-Man Homecoming deconstructed the Spider-Man tropes and put them into a fresh new package, that's been our goal, and especially with Season 4 of Christmas in July, where our fresh new package is we don't have to do 24 or 30, we only do 12. And that's it, folks. We like to fine-tune those tropes. We like to get that eggnog. Oh, by the way, Dragon, I had eggnog. Yeah. Yes, you did! You yeah. did! Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we just like to take them all. We like to take all those... All those good old tropes and, you know, and much like and much like what Peter Parker does, we like to study them. We like to dissect them. We like to pull them apart and piece them back together because, gosh darn it, that's just how we like to spend our time. But Tiki, I just, I can't help but feel I'm forgetting something within the last couple of minutes or at the very beginning of Act <laughs> one, one of our right. If there was only a term, to, I think it's probably because we're having such a good time with this Spider-Man, Spider-Man pitch, and we have all these wonderful ideas. Like, th folks, this is the culmination of, of our going through the going through the tropes. One could say because yeah, like we come up with a really great pitch, and how do we get a good pitch like this going? We have a good pitch going like this because we. We, we've seen so many Christmas specials. We know like when it, when it works and when it doesn't. So we put all the good stuff and some original ideas and some just general love we have for a for a show, material, or a character in the MCU, like Spider Man here. And Tiki, it's just it's eating away at me. It's 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 eating away at me like it does Wilson Fisk not having enough <laughs> not having enough money for posts to just send Daredevil that I hate you Christmas card. You know, it's like <laughs> Mr. Murdoch. I just I'm <laughs> Christmas letter, but I don't have the stuff. Tiki, oh, there was only it just oh Tiki, I almost uh, it's, it's I just wish I wish I wish I need a Christmas miracle. 
Okay. Oh, <laughs> Christmas miracle. If only there were a term. If only there were a simple term that maybe a Dr. Curtis Connors had figured out to analyze this seasonal process of coming up the perfect, the perfect Christmas analogy for going through trunks and keeping track of what works, what does not, what is repetitive, and what gives you that holly jolly feeling. For wow. Vanessa, do you have any suggestions, Davey? Do you? Yes, yes, Mr. Fisk. I believe the answer is putting the mistletoe underneath the microscope next time on Christmas in July. La 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 Mr. Murdoch. Whatever this kid's eating for breakfast, I want some.